Hello and welcome to the Beginner's Data Analysis Bootcamp with SQL Course. I'm Adnan Sheikh. I have been consulting for the Fortune 500 companies for the past 18 years and have successfully implemented multiple data projects. I was fortunate enough to go to one of the best schools in my field. I have taught multiple IT courses to professionals. I'm excited to launch this new comprehensive course on data analysis. You don't need to have a programming experience to enroll in this class. You can be from any walks of life and will highly benefit from this course. I will explain each topic in detail in my video lectures. Hi, I have put together this roadmap that will help you understand the blueprint of our learning path. First, we will start to learn about databases to gain basic understanding how to use them. In our class, we're going to be using MySQL as the preferred database tool. We will then start exploring the concept of data modeling, which will help you understand the different relationships between our data and their structures. Then we will introduce SQL, Structured Query Language. We will divide the SQL capabilities into different categories when it comes time to defining data, retrieving data, and manipulating it, and then joining, merging, and summarization of it. To further enhance our SQL skills, we will learn the core data functions based on data types, string numbers, and dates. Then we will look at some advanced data functions that SQL provides. Last but not least, we will be looking at data visualization. For our course, we're going to be using Tableau as the preferred data visualization tool. Hopefully this gives you an end-to-end -end picture of how the course's curriculum is structured. What are databases? So rather than getting into the technical details, let's, let's try to understand how we come across databases in our day-to-day -day lives. So if you're searching the web, anything you write, if you're searching for a particular keyword, any result set that you get back, that result set is coming back uh, from a database. If you go to an ATM machine and key in your passcode when you swipe your ATM debit card, the information gets checked against a database. Anytime you log into a web page with your username password, that username and password gets checked against a database. Anytime you pull up a bank statement, that bank statement is created from the data that is stored in the database. So that's kind of the way we interact with databases. So what you see on the slide here is that I have an Excel worksheet. So a lot of folks are still saving data in Excel worksheets. You keep adding you know, to your data set, you keep adding rows. So it's like a row and columns, and that's great. And for a lot of smaller companies, maybe Excel might be a solution. And I see people just saving data in text files. And companies are uh, producing data 24 seven. And with the age of internet, you know, data has grown astronomically. So what is the problem that we see here? Like what happens in your Excel when the data grows from 100 lines to 2 million records? How would Excel behave? Would it crash or do you have to split the files and how do you link the files back together? So definitely there's going to be a problem there. Ensuring the security and reliability of your data in this setup will also become a problem. Database software systems were designed to solve a problem. And I've just listed a few of the key issues that the database systems solve. So let's go for the first one, volume. I mean, data is increasing. It's compounding, astronomically increasing in terabytes, petabytes, zettabytes. And we need sophisticated softwares to manage that much volume of data. Security is another key issue that 
uh, companies are facing when their data gets hacked. So we need database software systems to have those security encryption layer added so we can protect our data. We have web applications that have millions of customers accessing their data. So we need sophisticated database systems that can handle these transactions simultaneously. Reliability becomes so important for companies where data is their business. I mean, for a stock exchange or a flight scheduling system, we cannot have data that is not correct. Data has to be reliable. Data is increasing, security is needed, millions of transactions happening at the same time. Data has to be reliable. So database softwares or database management systems are needed to solve these problems. We just need to understand that and get that in our head before we get into kind of looking at the features of the database management softwares. In the previous lecture, we looked at databases, what they are, and also go through some of the rationales as to why database management systems were created. So in this slide, I wanted to kind of give you an architecture view of how database management systems are used. This diagram is going to help you understand the different components that are used when you access data through a database management system. The user application layer. Think of this as where you have a client installed on your laptop. In our case, we installed MySQL Workbench. There are other client tools that can be used to access the database management system as well. I have shown Toad as one of those softwares and other reporting softwares can be used as well. Your client application needs to have an ODBC connection initiated. ODBC stands for Open Database Connectivity. So this driver needs to be in place for your client application to connect to the database management system or your database server. Once that connection is established, you can easily write a SQL script and access your data. I listed a few of the database management systems, IBM DB2, Microsoft SQL Server, MySQL, and Oracle database systems. And there are a lot of other vendors providing this software as well. There are different functionalities that are embedded in the management system. And we have functionality that handles transaction management. We have areas for handling security, data manipulation, defining data, loading data. And the database server also has an engine that can accept SQL language to be processed. And when we write a SQL script, as simple as select star from a table, that SQL statement gets processed via the DBMS. The DBMS needs to interact with the operating system to get to the data storage area or the data storage layer. The last layer is the data storage area. Your physical data files will reside on the disk. I'm showing customer order and product data is stored on the physical disk, but you would need a database management system to access this data and you would need a client like MySQL Workbench to be used via a SQL interface to get that data and be presented to you. These individual components will help you understand how the database architecture is set up. And it's very important to understand what the user application does and what the DBMS does and where the physical data files are stored. And I think once you can make a distinction it will really help you understand the database management system. Hi everyone. One of the key points I want you to take from this slide is that MySQL is being used by a lot of industry leaders. So if you look at the top left of the slide, these are just some of the companies that are 
using MySQL in production. So from Facebook to Walmart to Uber, I mean, these are all the companies, either they are using MySQL for their warehouse or their web applications. And if you look at the bottom left of the slide, I've given like a timeline, kind of the inception of the software. And it was built in 1995 by a Swedish company. And over the course of years, it has been acquired by different companies and, and Oracle uh, acquired it via Sun. So it has hundreds and millions of installation throughout the world. And it's built on some of the key features for a database, which are performance, reliability, ease of use, and cost. And if you look at the bar chart I've included, I mean, it tells you compared to some of the other database solutions, it is so cost effective. So the total cost of ownership, TCO, is really, really less compared to other software. Hi there. Great, so let's kickstart this installation. So we're gonna be installing MySQL for Windows. It's a very easy install. Uh, just follow the URL that I've given. All right, great. So we are on MySQL web page and follow the URL that I've given. We will be downloading the MySQL installer 8.0.12 and the first link here the one that I'm highlighting. Operating system is going to be Microsoft Windows for the OS and then click download. To log in or sign up, just say no thanks and move on. And you're going to get a, a save as um, option. So just save as, create a folder and save the file. The installer is going to start which is a 1.4 version. It's going to ask you to install and upgrade, so just say yes. We'll just get the new version as well. All right, so the first thing you're going to get is the license agreement. You're going to accept, read through and accept that. And there are different options to install. Uh, a setup type. So we're going to go to the custom. We just need a server and workbench. So we're going to select the server option, move to the right as a selection. And then we're going to go to the workbench, um, get that selected as well. Also, we're going to do the ODBC connection and a documentation. So we are just doing limited software uh, install rather than everything. I've fast forwarded the video, so it should take you no more than 10 to 15 minutes. It next. All right, so we're going to keep that replication to default. Just do next. Networking type, just keep it default next. Authentication method as well, just do it default next. And then just put up a, a password. Please make sure you remember this password because it's very important. Uh, you just put, put it in a piece of paper or a notepad somewhere. This is just going to be the, the, the service name. If you want to manually start the service, just to execute, it's going to uh, run a bunch of configuration files. Again, I have fast forwarded the video. Just to finish. On launching MySQL Workbench, it gives you a default connection, but we're going to create our own uh, MySQL connection. Just hit the plus sign and we'll give it a name. We'll just say SQL underscore class. Everything is all already filled up. Just do uh, OK. Double click on SQL underscore class. We're going to be launching a Workbench now. So this is the graphical user interface for MySQL. And we will write all our scripts there. We'll create tables, load data, and run different queries using this GUI interface. 
Hello students, so we're going to install MySQL on Mac OS. So I've given the URL um, you can use to download and go to the MySQL website. We're going to be downloading MySQL Community Server and also MySQL uh, Workbench. So we need these two softwares for the installation. All right, so we're going to first install the MySQL Server. Just follow the link and click on the community server. We're going to be downloading the DMG file for the MySQL community server 8.0.12. So these are different types uh, of files. So we'll just do the DMG. Again, just click download. Ignore the login and sign up at this time. So we'll just say no thanks and click on the link. I've fast forwarded the video so you have that uh, mountable disk image on your desktop. So now we're going to do the MySQL Workbench install. Scroll down and you'll find one file which is also the DMG file for Workbench 8.0.12 and click the download. Alright, so we have both the files on our desktop so we'll start with the server file. So click on that. So it's going to start uh, the install. Or you will need a password for your database. So please make sure you remember the password right on a piece of paper or notepad or save it. So we'll, we'll need this every time we connect to the database. So just please, please, please remember it. Now we should see the installation status as being successful. And now we have actually installed the server. We can go to preferences and just see MySQL um, in the list of uh, softwares being available. So we're good to go there. Now we'll click the workbench uh, DMG file and let it install. All right, so let's open the MySQL Workbench application. Great, so we have MySQL Workbench installed. Let's click on the icon for the connection that's already there. So we'll have a default connection created. At the install, we'll just type in the password that we, uh, we keyed in earlier. So hopefully you remember that. So it's going to try to connect to the database. All right, so we are successful in connecting to the MySQL server through uh, MySQL Workbench. This is the graphical user interface we're going to be using uh, to write our SQL scripts. And um, so hopefully during the course of the class, uh, we'll go step by step and you'll learn this interface uh, for your programming. Thank you. Hi everyone. So we will also try to access MySQL via the cloud instance. Uh, I'm going to be using Amazon Web Services. And, you know, looking into the future, I think uh, cloud implementation is going to be prevalent across a lot of companies going forward. So I think it's really good to have an experience using some sort of cloud service. So we're going to have the MySQL instance in the cloud and we're going to use our MySQL workbench to connect to the cloud instance. So you need to have an AWS account set up and I have given a URL at the bottom uh, for some uh, steps as to how to set up that account. So please follow that and hopefully the setup would be easy for you to create that account. So once you have your account set up, sign into the console and you'll get into the main uh, portal of AWS. You'll, you'll see a list of services. So 
So Amazon has a bunch of services from you know, spinning off servers, different storage options, database options, and so we're not going to go through all these details. So what we are interested in is setting up the MySQL server. So in the database category, we have RDS. So RDS is a, a subcategory where we have all the relational database systems that Amazon provides. So now please go ahead, uh, click on the button, get started now. So these are the list of relational databases that uh, Amazon is providing. You have SQL Server, Oracle, Postgres, MariaDB, and MySQL and Amazon Aurora. So we're going to go to MySQL. So we have two versions. Uh, one is the community edition and the other one is Amazon's Aurora. It's a, a different flavor of MySQL. And we're going to be using the community uh, server edition. So we're going to go click here. Please go ahead, use the dev and test instance because it uses the free tier so we don't get charged. So we want to say only show those options that are eligible for free tier. So we'll just click that. So we'll leave everything else here the same. So we need to specify a DB instance. So in, in my case, I'll just use uh, AMG Inc. Username student have to give a password next step so we can leave all this as a default database name we'll just say mysql cloud so we'll just leave all this as is backup we don't need any backups for this we'll just turn to zero relaunch so this will take a little bit of time uh, to spin off the server um, so I, what I'll do is I'll just pause the video all right so now our server is up and running and if you can see the status so now we need a connection string or an endpoint uh, that we're going to use in our MySQL workbench to connect to this instance. So if we go to Instance Actions, you'll get some more details on the server and you also get the endpoint. Okay, so this is our MySQL workbench. And now we're going to create a connection, a new connection to connect to the MySQL server on the cloud. So let's go back to our details of the server. So this endpoint is basically our connection string. So just copy this. In MySQL Workbench, we'll create a new connection. So click on the plus sign. All right, so we'll get a, a small window open. So we'll create a connection name. So I'll call it SQL underscore class underscore cloud. As far as the host name, we'll put the connection string there. We already have the port, so take the port out, out of the connection string. So for username, I, I had initially put in student. We'll just test the connection. Enter the password that you set up. All right, so we were able to make a successful connection to MySQL instance, which is in the cloud. So it'll, it'll create a small icon uh, for the connection. So just double click that. Great. So we are able to connect our MySQL workbench to the MySQL server instance on AWS. Hi there. 
All right, so now we have our MySQL workbench started. So, so the first thing you will do is try to connect to a database. So we have a MySQL connection. So it just gives you icons for your connections that are preset. So we're gonna use the first one that we set it up early. If you double click on that, I've already entered my password before, so it's just not, it's gonna just let me in, but it might ask you for a password, so just key in your password that you set it up. So now we are in the graphical user interface of MySQL, and this is the place where we're gonna be writing different scripts. So we have the query pen in the middle where we write uh, SQL statements. We have an object browser where we're gonna have different schemas and tables listed for metadata information. On the right hand side, we have SQL statements or snippets that we can use uh, for our SQL. So now we have kind of a common understanding about the interface. So if you look at the object uh, browser area, so we have uh, a SYS SIS schema that's created by default and it has objects underneath it. So we have tables, views, stored procedures, and functions. So we, for our class, will be interested in uh, creating tables, loading data, and querying those tables. So if you look at that, we have one table called sys underscore config. And let's say if we want to just access that table. So we'll come into our query pan and just write a simple select statement. It's a colon. And if you look at this uh, lightning icon at the top, it says execute the selected portion of the script. So just click that and you'll see a result grid, which kind of gives you the result set that you need from this table, sys underscore config. So when you initially load this table, sys might not be your default database. So just make sure you right click on sys and just set as default schema. So you don't need to prefix it with something like this. So even this will also work. Great. If you look at the right, this is what we initially were talking about, the snippets that MySQL give you. I mean, these are different categories that they have split into, the DDLs, the DMLs, and etc. Click on it and just check what the script would look like with all the options. So it's just kind of a handy tool to have uh, when you're trying to write uh, new scripts. And as you can see, it has insert, join, uh, select. It's kind of handy. And, and the output here is basically kind of a high level summary as to we ran the script, how much time the script took, and the records that got returned, the count of those records. And if any error comes in the scripts, it will be listed here as well. Great, I will see you in the next lecture. Great, so now we have the MySQL software installed. We have MySQL Workbench up and running. So now we need to create a database. So that's, this is the fun part. We're gonna download a sample database that MySQL provides. You're gonna follow the link. All right, so we are on the MySQL website. If you scroll down, you'll see the Sakila uh, you can pronounce it different way. I'll just call it Sakila a database. Just download the zip. We'll just do a save as. So we have a schema. That's where we're going to have the SQL statements to create our table structures. Then we have uh, data which is going to be a lot of insert statements creating this Sakila database. And then we have the data model of how these tables are structured and related. All right, so we're going to do a file. We're going to open script. Open Sakila schema SQL. All right, so we have our schema.sql file loaded in my SQL workbench. So it has a bunch of create statements, uh, creating actor table, address table, 
So we're going to be creating all our data structures through this script. And it also gives you additional information on the columns that we're going to be adding. So we'll just run this script all at once and it's going to create all the tables we need uh, for our exercise. Make sure the cursor is on the start of the script line and then click on the execute icon to execute the script. So just hit hit the uh, hit that icon. You can uh, ignore the warnings that we are seeing in the output. It's still going to create the tables. So if you go to the object browser on the sys icon, right click and refresh, you'll see the Sakila database and also if you open the tables uh, icon you'll see the list of tables that was created. Just say select star from the actor table. Click execute to run. So if you see we did not get anything back. There's no data in it. So now we need to load data into this database. So very simple, just go open, open script. We will select the data.sql file and load it. So this is sample data that we're going to be loading via the SQL insert statements to fill up our sample database. We will execute these scripts by clicking on the icon. So these insert statements will take a few minutes to load the data and you can see the status um, in the output pan as to how much time it's taking and how many records are being inserted. Let's try to see if we have data in, into one of the tables. So we'll just do run the same select star from actor table and see if we get data. So if you see in the result grid, um, the data is populated in the actor table, see the first name, last name, and the bunch of rows. So we are good to go here. Same way we can try to run the address table, select star from address. We should be able to see more data there. I will see you in the next lecture. Hi everyone. So now we're going to start a new section on data modeling. Understanding how data is related to each other becomes really, really important as we start our journey into the data analysis field. So we have to make sense of how data sets are related to each other so we can derive value of the data. The data becomes more meaningful if we are able to relate the data with each other. The byproduct of data modeling is a data model that gets created. It's a graphical layout. It becomes a communication tool that can be used for different groups to understand how the data is related to each other. We can use MySQL Workbench or Irvin software to do data modeling. You must have seen a picture of a data model and what I'm showing on the slide right now is just a sample set of tables and some of their relationships. The connecting lines between the tables show the relationship and we will go into detail in the later slides. We ran the schema file to create the table structures already. We loaded the data already and now we're going to be opening up the data model. So there's a .m wb file last file when you unzip so just double click on the file it should open the data model in the mysql workbench if this window shows just go ahead rename and it'll, it'll go ahead load the model click on the er diagram icon and then the model opens. So they have color-coded different sections based on the type of data there is. You have customers and inventory and all the related tables in certain subject areas and color-coded it. 
So this is the interface where you can view the data model and how it's related. Tables are one of the foundational structures in data modeling tables. So I've given an example of a country table. Now we're going to be talking about the building blocks for data modeling. First one being table or entity. You can use these names interchangeably. A table can be something for which you want to store data for or collect data for. Examples can be customer. If you want to collect data about a customer, its behavior. It can be automobile, the type of cars that are going on a particular highway. It can be products. So anything that you want to collect data for. Second, column or attribute. These are just characteristics of the table. So if you want to collect data for the customer, the customer being the table, the columns for the customer table can be first name, last name, phone number, address, etc. Third is data types. So each of those columns can have a certain type of data type. Data type, all it is, is that if it's a phone number, we have a number as a format of the column. If it's a name, then it's more of a textual data. So just the different flavors of those columns. Fourth is cardinality of relationship, is what defines how the two table or entities are linked with each other and just kind of is more of a descriptive way of saying how they are related with each other. And we're going to go into detail the different types of cardinalities and relationships they are present. Fifth is the primary key. Is kind of what defines the customer. Is it the social security number? Is kind of the primary identifier. And then foreign keys is a concept that will become more apparent as we go down explaining the different type of relationships and how tables are linked. So these six building blocks are very important to understand how data is related to each other. So we'll go and explain each of these building blocks in detail in the following slides. Tables are one of the foundational structures in data modeling. As the definition states, it's a collection of related data, right? So we were talking about if it's customer, we want to have a customer table. So it's a structured format in which databases create these tables. So I've given an example of a country table. Let's go try to look at each section of the table. So the stuff that's highlighted in orange are basically the attributes or columns. So we have country ID, we have country, and then we have last updated column. Country ID listing individual unique IDs, and then the country is listing a textual information, and then there's a time value for last updated. So these are columns or attributes. If you look at the bottom section of the slide, created that in green, those are actual values or data elements. So data elements are, if you look at the last row, country ID 9, so 9 Austria, each of these individually are data elements. If someone says, how many columns do you see in this slide? So I would say three, country ID, country, and last update. Data is added as rows or tuples. So if you look at horizontally, country ID 2, Algeria, and the last update value, that row becomes one record in the database. Another important concept is of primary key. Each of these rows that you see are identified by a unique identifier. So country ID 1 through 9 is unique. 
one, two, three, up to nine. So you don't see that being repeated. Understanding the way tables are structured is very important in defining the relationships that we're going to learn in the following slides. We will be talking about data types, or in other words, you can say is the type of format that a column has in the database. So whenever you try to insert a data, we need to know if it's a date, if it's a string, or if it's a number. So for a date column, date of birth. In this example, the format is first YYYY is the year portion, dash MM is the month, and dash DD is the day. So 2000 dash 10 dash 10 would be the format of a data element. And the second date format is a date where we have hours, minutes, and seconds as well. So for certain scenarios, we can have the date field defined in a more granular way. So date would be the first um, data type. Second data type is strings. So strings are more or less, you know, in a case of customer table, you know, we can have customer first name, last name, anything textual. And then we have two variations, a var car variable character and the character. We don't need to go too much into detail, but they both hold string values. The third category of data types come under number. So anytime we want to store numbers, you know, for instance, your car's mile, like we were talking about an automobile table. So if you have mileage for the car, that mileage column can be stored as a number. So for number, you can have a data type of an integer or a small int, depending on how big the number is. Or if you have decimal places we want to represent, like for instance, a customer paid amount, like if you paid for a Starbucks coffee and the amount was some dollars and then some cents. So we can represent that by a data type of decimal. If you know the data types and the category of date, strings, and numbers, you can do majority of the data analysis knowing these data types. We will be talking about the notations that we will be using in our relationships. So before we get into the different types of relationships, I just want to make sure we understand the language in which we're going to be um, depicting our relationship. So we're going to be using information engineering notation. So the, the process of designing the tables and its relationships is called entity relationship modeling. So if you look at the cardinality, that's just the maximum number of connections you can have between the two tables. So one would be just one vertical line, many would be a crow feet. Modality is just the least number of connections you can have in a relationship is zero or one. When you see a relationship in action, you will have both the maximum and the minimum number of relationships those two entities or tables can have. So that's why if you look at the right hand side, showing a cardinality and modality together. So the first relationship is showing one or many. And that's why you see the symbol for one as a vertical line and for many as a crow feet. The one at the bottom is zero or many. And you have a circle and a crow foot. So just getting an understanding of the symbols will really help you in the following slides. All right, now we will talk about different types of relationships that two tables or entities can have. First one is one to one. As the name suggests, it says one entity can only have one relationship with entity two and entity two can only have one relationship with entity one. So if you look at this example, we have a relationship between a manager table and an office. If you just look at the manager table, we have manager ID, first name, last name. So there are four different managers in our table. And if you look on the right hand side, we have an office table. So we have four different offices 
Chicago, New York, Seattle, and Columbus. So that's the data we are dealing with. If you look at the manager table, we have manager ID as the primary key. And in the previous lecture, we, we defined what a primary key is. It's a unique identifier. So manager ID one only relates to Eddie. Manager ID four only relates to Paul. If you look at the office table, we have primary IDs as office ID one through four. And then also we have another column manager ID in the office table. So it's, what it shows is that office one is managed by manager one. The location is Chicago. So manager ID being in the office table, this particular column is a foreign key because it is present in the manager table. So now there's a, a parent relationship and if you look at the line that connects these two tables, it's a straight line with two dashes on the side. So what that depicts is that the manager can only manage one office. If you look at from the office to the manager side, it says office can be only managed by one manager. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship. It's a mandatory relationship as the modality is also showing one with the vertical bar and the maximum relationship is also one. And another example can be US citizens and a social security table. So US citizens table, which has a first name, last name, and then another table as a social security. A citizen can only have one social security and a social security can only be related to one citizen. So hopefully that kind of clears that up as far as the relationship setting. So it's a one to one. So in this case, a manager manages one office and an office can only be managed by one manager. All right, so the second type of relationship is one to many relationship. This is one of the most common relationships that you'll find between tables. If you look at the example, it's between customer and order table. So if you just logically think in a scenario where a customer can have multiple orders, like if you go to Amazon, you can, you can put three orders. So that's a legitimate business case, right? So you can have multiple orders, but that individual order if you put three orders that it order one or the first order only relates to you none of the other Amazon customers right so the order is linked to one customer but the customer can put multiple orders and if you if you go with that mindset if you look at the relationship in the middle between these two tables we have a vertical line on the left, meaning that the order can have only one customer. On the right, we have a crow foot depicting the many portion of the relationship with the vertical bar depicting at least one. So the customer can at least have one order or many. And again, we have a primary key and a foreign key. So the primary key on the customer table is the customer ID and the primary key in the order table is order ID, great. But the order table also has a customer ID in it for this relationship to work. And that customer ID in the order table is a foreign key. And that customer ID is what that relationship is built on. Majority of the tables would fall into this category. Again, so if you look at this example, customers can put multiple orders and an order can only be placed by one customer. Third type of relationship is many-to-many -many relationship. Let's look at the example that we have. In the first table we have a student. So it just gives you a list of students that we have. So student ID, first name, last name, great. So we have a student table. Then if you look at the far right, we have a class table. It just gives you the different classes that are being offered. So English, math, chemistry, 
etc. So as long as student and class tables by themselves look fine, student has student information, class has class information. As we relate the student and class data together, there's an apparent many-to-many -many relationship between them. Since a student can take multiple classes and each class can have multiple students enrolled in it. We have a scenario where this relationship can capture other information like student grades, enrollment dates, and for this, it'll be better to make a junction table called enrollment that will capture this information. If you look at the way student is linked to enrollment, we have a one-to-many relationship where a student can be enrolled in one or more classes. And if you look at the relationship from right to left, from class to enrollment, a class can have one or more enrollments from the students. As you go forward in the data analysis field, you'll see more and more relationships would fall into this category. A fourth type of relationship is called recursive relationship. And if you look at the example of employees table, so you have employee ID, first name, last name. You also have a fourth column called manager ID. So the managers are also taken from the list of employees. So there is a relationship between manager ID and employee ID. So if you look at the bottom half of the table, we have a relationship going from manager ID to employee ID. So a manager can manage multiple employees. So if you look at the tail end of the relationship, it's a crow feed saying many and at least one. An employee can be managed by one manager or in some cases may not have a manager at all. So that's the other side of the relationship and that's why you see employee one not having any manager ID. If we look at Mike and Jay, employee two and three, they are being managed by Eddie, who has an employee ID of one. And nobody's managing Eddie. He's a top level employee and that's why you see manager ID has no information. So this is an example of a recursive relationship where we have a relationship within a single table and manager ID is a foreign key to the employee ID column. So hopefully this was helpful. This type of relationship is rare to have, but it's good to know when doing data analysis. So now we have kind of looked at the building blocks of data modeling, you know, what, what a table is, what are columns, attributes, what is a primary key or a foreign key, what are data types, and how tables are related and types of relationships that can exist between tables. Understanding normalization becomes important as more and more data comes into your database. So what normalization is, is a process in which we try to break a bigger table into smaller tables. And what it does is that it helps you reduce redundant data or duplicate data. Normalization goes through a few steps and each of these steps are called normal forms. We go through first normal form, then second and then third. And overall normalization, if you look at some of the benefits, is that you save the storage. It's easy on maintenance for the database because you're updating less data. IO activity gets improved and also it helps query and reporting. I will show you an example of an employee table and we're going to take that table from first normal form to second and then third normal form and you will see the transition as to how we go through this whole process and hopefully with this example the normalization process of a table will become easier. We have been given this employee table and are tasked to normalize it up to the third normal form. Let's take a step back and look at the data closely. We have an employee ID which uniquely identifies an employee, a department code that is unique for a department. We have employee name, department, three columns that have phone numbers in them, employee start date and employee vested indicator. So that's the data that we are dealing with. And we have to take this table through the normalization process of first normal form up to the third normal form. When you're dealing with the first normal form, you need to ask two questions. Are there any repeating groups, meaning are there two or more columns that are closely related to each other? If they are, we need to create a new table for them. Second, make sure that all the attributes are single valued attributes. 
let's take a look at the employees tables. If you look at the employee name, we have first name, last name in one column. That's our first candidate as we should not have any multi-valued attribute. So what we do in the first normal form, we split the employee name into the first name and last name to take care of the multi-valued attribute. If you look at the first phone number, all the phone numbers there are different and it has to be the employee phone number. Phone number two, it seems like that phone number is dependent on the department. If you see finance, the finance department has the same number. So it is the department phone number. Phone number three has all the phone numbers being the same. That can be looked at as a company phone number. Employee start date and employee vested indicator can move as is. We also improve the metadata or the column names for all the three phone number columns and add employee department and company labeling to them as it makes more sense. Now our employee table is in first normal form. Let's get that ball rolling to the second normal form. The most important question you wanna ask is when you're transforming your table from the first normal form to the second is that to make sure that all non-key columns are functionally dependent on the entire primary key. So what are the non-key columns? Employee last name, employee first name, department, employee phone number, department phone number, company phone number, employee start date, and employee vested indicator. These are all non-key columns. So what the rule says is that they need to be functionally dependent on the entire primary key. So the primary key here is employee ID and department code. Right, those are the unique identifiers. But if you look at the employee first name, last name, that is dependent on the employee ID. An employee ID should be able to give us the employee first name, last name. If you look at the department, department is dependent on the department code. So you see, we have some columns in the table depending on one part of the key and the other columns are dependent on the other part of the key. So what we need to do is we need to split the table where the columns are dependent on the whole key. So that's why you see the employee table being split and having the employee first name, last name, phone number, employee start date and employee vested indicator. They're all dependent on the employee ID. For department, you see we have department, department phone number, and the company phone number that are dependent on the department code. Great. So we have those two tables transformed into the second normal form right now. We also need to capture the relationship between the employees and the department data. Right, employee can work in different departments and the department can have multiple employees. As you recall from the earlier lecture, to resolve a many-to-many -many relationship, we had to create a junction table. So in this case, it'll be the employee assignment where we're gonna have an employee ID and a department code as being the two columns in the relationship. So if you look at the relationship from employees to employee assignment, it's a one-to-many. And if you look at from department to Employee assignment is also one to many. So how are you going to capture the relationship and have the employee and department being in the second normal form? Great. All right, let's get the ball rolling. For a table to be in third normal form, we should not have a situation where an attribute depends on another attribute that is not the primary key of that table. It's also called transitive dependency. Very important rule that the non-key columns in the table should not have dependence between them. Secondly, we should not have any derived data, such as like total columns that are derived from other columns in the table. So if you look at the employee table, we have employee vested indicator that is dependent on the employee start date. So for a certain start date, the indicator either turns yes or no. So that is definitely one candidate that we can address in our third normal form. So if you look at the employee table in the third normal form, we only have first name, last name, phone number, and start date. All those columns are only dependent on the primary key. 
and there's no dependency between the non-key columns. If you look at the department, that is already in the third normal form. As you go through different projects and, and as you go through your data modeling assignments, you'll find that the third normal form is where majority of the transformation stops. There are some higher normal forms like boycott normal form, fourth and fifth normal form, which do occur and people do use them, but very rarely. I will try to add some slides for those normalizations at a later time. All I will say is that with practice, data modeling becomes easier and easier. You need to understand the business as to how the data is captured and what the data means. Practicing the normalization rules and being close to the data will help you in your data modeling projects. Hi there. We went through learning about databases and then data modeling, and now we're going to be learning about SQL. SQL is a programming language used to interact with the relational databases. SQL is an acronym for structured query language. The syntax of SQL is very easy to learn. It's pretty descriptive. A lot of keywords that are used to do the operations are self-explanatory. Different relational database systems have some flavor of SQL that they have rolled out. And each flavor has some functions that might be different from the other version. But in all, the basic uh, SQL syntax remains the same. We will be using SQL to interact with our MySQL database. We're going to be going through different categories in which SQL statements can be placed. SQL was standardized by American National Standard Institute, NC for short, in 1986, and it has gone through multiple revisions. We can put SQL commands into different classifications. The first one is DDL, Data Definition Language. So whenever you're trying to create a table, alter it, drop it, these SQL keywords can be categorized within DDL. And we have a separate slide where we're going to go through examples for creating DDLs. Second is DML. DML statements pertain to either inserting, updating, or deleting data. And we will go through some examples of those. Third is DQL, data query language. And this is the select keyword. You must have seen a select statement in the past as well. So this is basically a generic SQL statement which can help you retrieve data. Fourth one is DCL, data control language. The statements in DCL are normally used by database administrators, like granting privileges or revoking them. We won't spend time doing data control language examples, but we will go through examples that will fall under DDL, DML, and DQL. All right, so now the fun begins. We're going to be writing uh, SQL code. So we're going to go through DDL statements. As in the previous slide, I was saying it's the data definition language. We will be creating a table. And then also, we can either alter it, drop it, or truncate it. So let's, let's take the first example in creating a new table. All right, so we'll be creating a new table called students. And we're going to be using a keyword called create table and then the name of the table, which will be students. Open bracket and close bracket, so we'll list a different set of columns. Students think of columns as attributes, like what kind of data do you want to capture for the students? So, okay, you have your student ID, his first name, last name, date of birth, phone number, address, just a general information about the students. So whenever you want to add a column, you have to have a data type what defines the type of data that will go into the column. So for instance, student ID, we use INT as integer. First name, last name is going to be variable character, var car for short. It's going to be string value. So anytime you have a string value, just use a variable character or character. You can use either or. One is fixed length, the other one is variable length. And whenever you're defining a string, you will basically give the length of the string values. In this case, it's 20. Date of birth, 
is going to be a data type of date. Phone number is again is going to be a string. Address is going to be a string. And if you see address, I've kept it at 100. We might have more information on the address. We need to add a semicolon to indicate the end of the statement. So just highlight this portion and execute. Great, so now we have successfully executed a create statement. So if you go under the tables section of the database Aquila, we need to refresh the tables and do refresh all. And then you will see the students table. You can open the students table here and drill down into the columns and you will see the list of columns that we created. Great, so now you have created a student's table. All right, so now we have created the student's table. Let's try to add some columns to the table and drop some. And we can even go ahead and modify a data type. So if you look at the alter table syntax, so we have the alter table as keyword. We have to use alter table and then the name of the table that we want to alter, right? So it's going to be alter table students. And we want to add address line and address two as two new columns. So we're going to use the add keyword. And we'll also have to give data type. In this case, I'm going to be giving 100 uh, length for each column. And it's going to be comma when we end. We'll be then using the drop keyword to drop a column. So we'll be dropping the address column. And if you want to modify a column, we just use the word modify, last name. And we're going to be changing, initially, the string data type was of length 20. So we're going to be using now 30. So now we can just run this, highlight the whole statement, and just run it. Great. So our alter statement was executed successfully. We can come down to the object browser and look at our student table. So we have student ID, first name, last name, phone, and address. So it's actually showing the older image. So just do a refresh all. And if you look at the last name, it's a variable length 30. Great. So now we have altered the table. To drop a table or to delete table, we just say drop table and the name of the table. So what this will do is it will drop the student table. And then we also have a truncate table statement. If we do truncate table, it basically empties out all the records in the table. So right now we have our student table is empty, so it won't perform a particular action because the table is empty. So we run the drop command. And as you see, the student table has been deleted. The next category in which we can put the SQL statements are DMLs, so data manipulation languages. So we can create statements to either insert data, update data, or delete data from the table. So we'll practice each one of these statements and see how the database behaves. All right, so we'll be inserting a record into the country table. So let's see what we have in the country table already. Okay, great. So we, we have a bunch of records. We have about 109 records in the country table. So if you want to insert data into the table, you have to use the keyword insert into and then the table name open brackets and you have to list the columns country table has country ID country and last update so we'll list those three columns and then we close the brackets so the first set of columns are going to be the number of columns that are in the table and then we have the values as a keyword then we list the data values that we want to insert into the table separated by commas so for country ID we're going to put 110. If you look, we already have the last record in the table as ID being 109. 
So we'll we'll put 110. We'll put as a country name as my land. And for the last update, th this is a function. Don't worry about it. Just you can just put it as is. It says current underscore time. Open and close bracket. This just gives you the current time when you insert the record. Close bracket. So insert into table name. List the columns that are in the table. Then the values keyword. Open bracket and then insert the data and separate it by a comma. All right. So let's execute this. Okay. So we have affected one row you can look here at the bottom so let's try to select data from the country table and see if we got our record in so let's scroll down so as you can see the record with country id 110 was inserted great now we want to update the same record and set the country name to no man lands. So we use the keyword update the table name, set country, the column that we want to update, equals to, and we need to put this in uh, quotes, no man lands. We use the where keyword, country ID equals 110. So this is going to filter the data this will filter the data to the record which we inserted that was 110 and this will the set keyword is going to update the value in the country column for the record where the country id is 110 so we run this you see it has been updated to no man's land Great. So if you want to delete a record from the table, we use the keyword delete from table name. And then we use where is when we want to qualify and get to a particular record into the table and filter it. So where country ID is equal to 110. So let's run this. So now if you do select star from country we should not have any record with country id 110 yep so that has been deleted great we will be looking at the most common sql statement that is used to get data from the database it's a it's a very simple statement but it's very powerful at the same time i have tried to put this visual for the select statement, I just wanted to make sure that you understand each component of the select statement. A lot of times people probably know select statement partially and they miss the other details. So hopefully this picture will help you understand each component of the select statement that is used to retrieve data from the tables. Select selects the number of columns from basically list the tables you want to get data from where is basically where you put the filter condition to filter your data order by is where you list the order in which you want to see the data and limit is where you want to limit the number of rows you get back all right so let's get this kick started so first script we have is select star from actor so we're going to retrieve data from the actor table we're using a semicolon in the end to end the statement. We are using the select and from keyword. The star or asterisk depicts you want to bring back all the columns from the table. So if you don't, I mean, otherwise you have to list, let's say the table has 20 columns. You don't want to list each one of them. Highlight the script and run. So you'll get the data from the table. So about 200 records in the table. Now let's say if you just want to bring back first name and last name. So we do select, we just list out the first name and columns will be separated by a comma. First name, comma, last name. From keyword and then actor and semicolon. 
So we just get those two columns. It's pretty straightforward and self-explanatory. Let's say if you want to label the first name as employee name, we have to use the keyword as, and then just use the column name as the given label name from the table. And you have employee name and the rest of the data comes in. Great. Now let's say if we want to order the data, order by first name. So we'll still do the same. This piece of the select statement remains the same. We have a select first name, last name from customer. We use the keyword order by. And which column do we want to order by is first name ascending. So let's run that. Great, so you see the data comes back and is ordered by the first name ascending. And let's take an example of a payment table. So let's use the payment table and order by amount descending. So amount should go down when the data comes back. So you see, first we have a higher amount, then it goes down. Let's say if you want to, we can also add a sort on two columns. So we'll first sort by the first name. So we can sort the customer data by first name, last name together as descending by just using order by first name, comma, last name, descending. Let's just run that. So great, so it has ordered it. Now let's say if we want to bring just the first five records from the customer table. So um, this is going to be a traditional select star from table order by customer ID. And as you can see, about 600 records come back. And say we have to use the keyword limit and then give the number of records we want. And then colon. So let's run this. We only get five records back. So this is by using the keyword limit and then the number of records you want back. You can also pick a range when using the limit keyword. So if you say two comma five, that means that it's going to bring five records, but it's going to start from the third record of the table. This is a list of SQL comparison operators that you can use when you're trying to filter data from the data set. So whenever you use the keyword where, you can use a particular column. And then if you want the column to have a value equal to something or not equal to something, greater than, less than, so you can use these mathematical operators. We also have operators like in, open bracket, and close that gives you the option to list multiple values also, between gives you an option to pick a range via if it's the range in the date or the amount. Null and not null is where you have an absence of data and you just want to pick the value where there's no data in the column. Like is also a very popular operator which you can use to pick data that follows a certain pattern. We will be using the WHERE clause to filter the records coming back from the database. We already know how to select data from a table, right? So let's highlight the portion where it says select star from customer. So you will get pretty much all the records from the table, right? So let's say if you want to only pick Mary, you use the WHERE keyword following by a column name that you want to filter on equals Mary it has to be in single quotes is a string string value and then semicolon so let's run this okay, so we found one record in the customer table which satisfied this condition if you want to pick customer data where the first name is not equal to Mary you just use explanation mark and then equal together and then marry. So if you run this, 
you will filter out all the records where the first name is Mary. All right, let's take an example where we want to apply two conditions to filter the data. So we're using the payment table. We want to pick all the records from the payment table where the payment date is greater than 2006, Jan 1st, and the paid amount is greater than 4. So we have to apply two conditions to filter the records. So we'll do select star from payment where payment date will use greater than the set date in single quotes and amount greater than 4. So let's run this. So you'll see all the payment dates are greater than 2006, Jan 1st, and the amounts are greater than 4. Great. Let's try to filter the last name of the customer from a given list of names. We can use the not in open brackets and give the list of those names. So if you run this, so all the last names are returned back and Davis, Miller, and Wilson records are filtered out. Let's take an example where we want to filter the payment records based on a date range. We can use the between keyword and give the starting date in a single code and the ending date. So the records that are returned are a payment date between these two dates. We can also use the order by payment date. So let's run this. So 2005 July 5th is in the range of 2005 July 1st to 2000 July 31st. All these records are in the month of July. We can also filter customer data based on a pattern that we find in a string value. So we can use the keyword like followed by a single code and the two characters of the first name, in this case AN, followed by a percent sign and close quote. Let's run this. It's returning all the first names where the first two characters are AN. Likewise, we can run the same like command, but have the percentage in the start, meaning that the last character would be Y in this pattern. So let's do run that. So you look at the first name, the last character is Y in all these records. And this is a very powerful operator. Great. One of the tasks that data analysts do is bring data together from different data sets. And that is achieved by joining tables together. The first type of join we're going to look at is called inner join. So if you look at the Venn diagram, table A and table B have something in common. And that common data element will be used as a key to join these two tables together. The syntax for the inner join can be in an implicit way or an explicit. Implicit is basically when you're using the inner join keyword. So let's take an example of the first syntax. Select from table A, inner join table B on, and then we list the keys from both the table that we want to join on. That's kind of an implicit way of saying it. We can also use Instead of on, we can use the using keyword and just list the key that is common between those two tables. Explicit ways where you say from table A, comma table B, where A dot column equals B dot column. So that's just a, a different flavor in which you can get the same results. You can open the data model from the file itself Click the ER diagram icon to open the model. When joining tables, it's really important to know what the data model looks like. Right, so let's say if you want to join country and city, we want to know which column the relationship between these two tables are built on. 
So what column in country table and what column in the city table the two tables can be joined on. So it's going to be select country and city column from city table, inner join country table using country ID as the column that is common between both those tables where countries equal to United States. So whenever you're trying to join the tables, you need to look at the data model, right? So what data model will give us the relationship of how tables are joined together. So let's switch to the tab where we open the data model. So we are looking at the country and the city table. And if you can see, we have country ID common between those two tables. So that means that we can use the country ID column in our join condition. So we have used the country ID column as the joining column between city and country table. And we are also using the keyword inner join. And what that means is we want to bring back only those records where the country ID has same data between those two tables. And we want to filter where the country is United States. So what the SQL will return is the list of all the cities in the United States. You're given the task to find the list of films where the language is not English. So we're going to go back to our data model. So film and language table are joined on language ID. So let's go back to our SQL. So select, we're going to select title and name from film inner join language table using language ID where name not in English. So we want to bring back all the films where the language in which the film was made is not English. And we don't have any records right now in the database that satisfied this condition. We can modify this script to bring back films that were made in English by taking the not out, just having the name in English. Now let's say we have a scenario where we want to generate the list of customers which live in Barcelona. So let's go back here. It'll be a three table join, customer, address, and city. Let's look at our SQL. Select, so we are selecting a bunch of columns from, from these tables from customer, inner join address, using the address ID. So if you look, this is how the customer and address are joined on address ID. And then we're joining address, inner join to the city table on city ID here. So they are joining on the city ID column. So this will be our joins for three tables where city equals Barcelona. So you see the, the column city, but to get to that, we had to go from customer to address to city to relate all this data together. Now if we run this, we should get all the customers living in the city of Barcelona. So we have one customer that lives in Barcelona. So this is a very powerful join statement. And as you can see, you have joined three tables on these common data elements. So let's say you want to bring back customers that live in Barcelona. And during their rental period, they have paid more than $5 in rental cost. So you'll be joining the payment table with the customer table. So if you go back here, so there is a customer ID 
that joins the customer and the payment table right here. So you're joining, so the rest are the same. We already did this join, so we're just adding another payment table. And then we have an amount greater than five. So let's run this. So if you see, we are getting records for the same customer. So where he has two transactions where the amount was greater than five. So it's giving you a transaction history for the customer living in Barcelona where the payment amounts are greater than five. The second type of join is called left join. So left join brings all the data from table A along with the data that matches between A and B. The syntax for left join is select from, and we use the keyword left join. So table A, left join, table B, using the common key fields between those two tables. So we want to get the list of staff members and indicate which one are managers. But the list should also give you staff members who are not managers as well. So for that, we will be using a left join. We need to insert these two records. So we have enough data to make this example work. So if you come back to the model, we have staff and store table linked by the staff ID. The table store has those staff IDs that are managers. And then of course we have the relationship on store ID as well. So we will be joining the staff table and the store table with a left join. That means that it's going to bring all the records that are in the staff table along with the ones that are in store. And we're going to join on staff ID equals manager staff ID. So this should give us all the records in the staff table along with those staff members that are managers as well. So if you see First name, last name is coming from the staff table. So we have four staff members right now in our database. Manager staff ID is coming from the store table and only Mike and John are managers. So for Johnny and Jimmy, there's no record in the store table. That's why we have null, means no data. So this way you can see that left joins are useful for certain scenarios so where we want to bring all the data from one table and link it with the records that are matching between the two tables as well. Or right, another variation of left join is left outer join, meaning that I just want to get the records in table A which are not present in table B. So what you can do is that you can do select from table A, left join, table B, using the key that is common between the table, where table B's keys equal null. So if you pick this last option where table B's key, which means this table, equals null, you will get all the records in table A. So let's say if you want to get the list of staff members who are not managers, We'll do a left outer join, and the way we achieve that is we join staff to store with keyword using left join on staff ID equal manager staff ID. We are using the on keyword in our join condition, so the column names in the two tables are not spelled the same way. So till here, it's exactly the same as a left join, but when we add the where clause, the staff ID from the store table is null, then it only returns those records from staff table and not the ones that are matching between those two tables. So if you compare this with the other left join, this is only bringing those staff members that are not manager. Great. Third type of join is a right join. Basically, it's the reverse of the left join. 
and syntax would be select from table A right join table B using the common keys. It brings all the data from table B and links the records between table A and B. We also have right outer join which is the opposite of left outer join. So select from table A right join table B using the common keys where. Now in the previous one when we had left outer join we were using table B's key as null, but in this one we will use table A key as null. So it's just the reverse of left outer join. For the right join and the right outer join, I don't have any lab exercises for you, but that's something that you can try to practice on your own using the Sakila sample database. Fourth type of join is called cross join is basically trying to join two tables that don't have an apparent relationship. And this type of join is also called Cartesian product. One of the things you have to be careful about is that you can do cross join between two tables if the number of records in both the tables are pretty small. I'm talking about five to 10 records and maybe 20 records or so. And they're normally code values with some descriptions. So it's like if you have a specific use case where you have to create a, some sort of a mapping, a code mapping between two tables, then you can use cross join. The syntax for this is select the list of columns from table A, cross join table B. So it's gonna show one value of table A being repeated for each value in table B. That's why the number of records get multiplied by the number of rows you have in table B and A. So let's look at an example of a cross join. So we'll create two tables, one t-shirt underscore color, the other t-shirt underscore size. So one has number of colors and the other has the number of sizes that a t-shirt can have so we'll just run let's look at what data we have in t-shirt color table so in the t-shirt we have two records one is black and one is white and let's look at the t-shirt size table So we have four sizes, small, medium, large, and Excel. So now, if we want to find out the maximum number of combinations between the color and the t-shirt size, we can join the t-shirt color table with the t-shirt size table and do a cross join. It's going to give us the maximum possible combinations that are possible between the colors we have and the sizes. Great, so with black, you can have four sizes, small, medium, large, Excel, and with white, you can have four sizes as well. Fifth type of join is a self-join. You have to create an alias of a table. So let's say if the table is A, you have to create an alias A1 and A2 to join the table together. Self-join normally are rare, but there are some use cases in which you have to use a self-join. For instance, if you have an employee table and there's a column in which you have a manager ID, that manager ID is pointing back to the employee ID column in the employee table. So the same table has an inherent relationship within the table itself. So let's go to an example and see how this can work in practice. So let's say we want to get a list of managers and their direct reports. So for this example, we have to create a table called employee manager. So just go ahead, create a table. Let's insert a number of records here. Great, so we have six employees and their full name and the manager ID. So for example, employee one, Matthew, is being managed by Grace. And Grace is being managed by Alice. And there's a relationship between the table itself. So let's take a look at this self-join SQL. So let's take 
take it piece by piece. So we have created an alias for the employee underscore manager table E1. We're doing a right join employee underscore manager E2. So you're doing a right join between E1 and E2 on employee ID. Think of E1 as the manager list and think of E2 as the employee list. And we are selecting E2 employee full name, which means we want all the employees to be listed. We're just giving a label as employee. So all this statement is doing here is that if null, meaning that if the manager value is null, meaning the employee does not have a manager, we label it with no manager. And this is just a label to give the column. So if we run this, so you'll see we get all the list of employees and their corresponding manager. So if you look at the last row, Alice Cooper does not have a manager. So let's look at just the employee table again. Alice Cooper, the manager ID is null. So when we run this, it found null and it replaced it with no manager value, which we'd give here. So self joins are rare, but it's good to have a knowledge about. In SQL, we have an area where we can actually do set operations. I mean, set is, is a branch of discrete mathematics, but when it comes to uh, databases and SQL, you can perform set operations by using the keyword union, intersection, and minus. MySQL supports union only. Intersection and minus can be mimicked by some variation of the SQL itself. So if you look at the union operation, set one has one, four, 10 data elements, and set two has nine, 10, and 11. If you do set one union set two, we're gonna get all the data from set one and set two, and there won't be any duplicates. So if you look at the left bottom portion of the slide, you have query one, union query two. And one of the things you have to be cognizant about is that column one and column two in both queries need to have same data type. When you're doing the union operation, the columns that you select in query one need to match the columns from query two. When I say match, the two columns need to have similar data types between the two queries. Also, you have to make sure that the number of columns between the two queries are the same and the order in which the columns are listed is also the same. And also have similar data pertaining to each other. If you use a slight variation to union and use union all, it will not remove the duplicate. So you will have duplicate values if you just do union all. So it's a simple operation which brings data from two tables together and appends data from query one to query two. We will create two tables, set one and set two. and we will insert some data into those two tables. So let's see what we have in set one. Right, so we have four values, Eddie, George, Charlie, and David. Let's see what's in set two. So we have Eddie and Charlie. So let's say we want to bring data from both the tables. Eddie and Charlie is in set two. So set two is a subset of set one. So when we run the union statement, so the first query is select star from set one and the query two is select star from set two, we should get all the records from set one as they are common in set two as well. So let's run this. We should still get the same value for records. Great, but let's say if we use union all, we should get six records, even 
two of them are duplicates. So see we get Eddie and Charlie. Second type of set operator is intersection. So set one intersects set two is going to only bring back whatever is common between those two sets. So MySQL doesn't support the intersect keyword, but we can get the similar result by using exists or in operator. So again, we're going to have query one exists, and then we're going to use the query two. So in query two, we're going to be joining the two tables together based on column one and column two. And when we run this, it's going to only bring back the records that are common on those two columns. Similarly, we can use the in operator. In the in operator, we don't need to physically join the columns. We can just do a lookup. Think of in as a lookup. So, so select column one, column two from table A where. So in the brackets, we give what columns we want to look up. Column one, column two in the second query. And then we select the columns that we want to look up to. In my experience, exists performs better with data and in is a little bit slower from a performance perspective. So we want to get back data that set one and set two have in common. So if you look at the version one of the script, so we are saying select star from set one, where X and Y are the columns of set one in and then we have open brackets and close and select star from set two. So this will bring only those records that are common between those two sets. So as you remember, set one had four records and set two had two records that were present in set one. So we should get two records back. Great, so we have Eddie and Charlie that comes back. We can also run the same command using the exists keyword. With exists, we have to use a join condition. So we'll select star from set one. I'm giving it an alias A, where exists, open bracket, select star from set two, alias B, where, so this join conditions on column one and column two needs to be present in the second query to link it to the set one. So this physical linkage needs to exist when we're using this type of SQL. When we're using in, we did not need it the join condition. So that's kind of the apparent syntax difference, but exist is faster when there's a lot of data. So we get the same result. Great. The third type of set operation is minus. Basically, set one minus set two will give you elements that are in set one, but not in set two. If you look at the example on the slide, set one has one, four, 10 data elements, and set two has nine, 10, 11. If you do the minus operation there, you will get one and four as a result, just as a mathematical operation of subtraction. MySQL does not support minus keyword, but we will still achieve the same results by using not exist or not in keyword. As far as the syntax goes, it is the opposite of what we did earlier for the intersection lecture. So instead of exist, we will use not exist, and instead of in, we will use not in. For the lab exercises, I have attached the SQL scripts to the lecture notes which will help you go through the minus-like operations within MySQL. Aggregating and summarizing of data is at the core of data analysis. To be good at data analysis, you need to understand how aggregation works. I'll be introducing a new keyword, group by, that is normally used with a lot of aggregate functions. And we will go through a lot of examples where we are using group by clause. Group by can also be used with a roll up keyword. All this will make sense when we go through the examples in our lab. So we have a list of aggregate functions. If you look at the first table on the left, we have average, count, maximum, minimum, and sum. These are some of the common aggregate functions 
that you can use on the data set. If you look at the table on the right, these are statistical functions that you can apply on numerical data in your data set to derive standard deviation and variance. So I have put together this diagram to just show you how the aggregate functions when they are applied to the data would look like. So this is just an imaginary table with customer ID and payment column. And if you see on the right hand side the syntax to actually apply the aggregate functions on the payment column. So it's select sum open bracket and the column that you want to sum on and then close bracket comma and likewise you can put average min max comma and then and count one is going to give you the total number of records in the table from the given table so once you run these aggregate functions you will get a summary record and that summary record is going to add up all your payments average the payment give you a minimum maximum and the count of the record this is a quick way to get your summary statistics. So in this example, we are not using group by clause yet. We will use that at a later example. So if you look at the payment table in our database, it has an amount field. So these are all the amounts that customers paid when renting the movies. So we want to get the minimum payment, maximum, average, total, and then also the number of transactions we have. So we're going to use aggregate functions and it should give us one record. So let's run that. So if you see, we get one record back summarizing the data in the payment table. So the amount field has the minimum payment as being zero, maximum payment being $11.99, average total sum of the payment, and then the total number of transactions we have, which are 16,049. So this is a quick way to just get a summary data from a table by using these aggregate functions. If you look at the diagram, what the group by does is that it partitions the table based on the customer ID. So if you look at partition one, there are four transactions that customer one did with 20, 30, 30, and 40. So that partition is going to get aggregated and you will see one record for customer ID one. Same thing with partition two, three, and four. So the group by is basically isolating and aggregating each customer's data. If you look at the syntax, there's a new addition to our previous SQL, which is a group by customer ID and also we have added that in the select piece of the SQL as well so we are adding a customer ID comma and then the aggregate functions that are going on to the payment column this is a very powerful SQL statement that is used number of times in multiple projects so if you get to understand this SQL it will really help in your data analysis activities for this lab, we'll be creating an employee table to so just run this create statement and the insert statements. And you should be able to see an employee tables record. So we have ID, employee name, department name, salary, and age. So this is the data that we loaded right now. So we want to see the total salary per department and also you want to see the number of employees in that department. So to get that data, we need to group by department name, right? So that would be our partitioning field. Whatever group by column we use, we have to use it in that select as well. We're going to sum on the salary, label it as total salary, and then we're going to do a count. And this count is going to go per department, and that will be the total number of employees. So let's run this. Great. So we see that for each department, we are able to get the total salary, and we are able to get the total number of employees. So such a simple group by statement has produced really important information that can be used by the business. So let's take another example. Keeping the SQL the same as the previous one, we'll just add the with rollup keyword after the group by department name. 
So what this does is that it adds another record apart from what we already get from the group by and gives us a total summary record along with the group by records. So if you see the last record, so it added up all the salary column and added up the employees column. So the total salary is 44,000 and the total number of employees are 11. So this roll up gives us a summary record that gets added to the group by results. So it can come really handy when needed. So if you want to filter the group by results, you can use the keyword having and then the group by column and you can use an operator to filter the records. So if you see the example, we are saying having sum of payments greater than 120. So by using the having clause, it's going to only bring back those customers where the sum of their payments is greater than 120. So if you look at this table, the sum of the payments for customer 4 is greater than 120. The rest are less than 120. So that record is going to be returned. So having keyword can be used to filter group by records further. If I just run that piece, what we did before, so we're going to get HR production service and sales with their total salaries in that department and the total number of employees. So now if we want to filter this result set to only show those salaries where the sum is greater than 18,000, only production record should show. So we'll use the having keyword and then do some salary greater than 18,000. So only production record should show. Let's run this. Great. So you can see that having keyword can be used to filter group by records further. Subqueries are like nested queries. So you have a main query and then a subquery. There are two types of subqueries. One is correlated and the other one is non-correlated subquery. Correlated subquery is dependent on the main query in such a way that for every row in the main query, the subquery gets executed at least once. Non-correlated subqueries are independent of the main query and they get executed once. We have a list of predicates that can be used between the main and the subquery. Exist, not exist, and in are some of the common predicates that we can use and we had some earlier lectures on that. Additional set of predicates are any, all, or some and we'll see some example of those and some comparison operators that can be used as well. Hopefully this visual will help you understand the building blocks of setting up a subquery routine. We will do some lab exercises in which the concept of correlated and non-correlated subqueries will become much more clearer. So let's look at the first example of the subquery. We want to get the list of customers' names where the rental duration is more than five days. So they have rented the movies for more than five days. So for this information, we need the customer table and the rental table. So rental table will have information about the movie as to when the movie was rented out and when it was returned. And the customer table has the first name, last name. So we'll start with select first name, last name from customer table. So this is pretty straightforward where we're going to use the exists keyword open bracket and then we will start our subquery. So this is our subquery. So we're going to select star from rental and we're going to give it an alias R where and so this is the join. Customer ID is common between rental and customer table. So this makes this subquery correlated query. Date diff gives you a difference between two dates. It's just a function that uh, MySQL has and we'll go into date functions at a later lecture but for now just just think of this function returning the difference between these two dates and it will be greater than 5. So let's run this. So this gives you the list of customers 
who rented the movie for more than five days. Let's take a second example where we want to get the list of movies that are not available in any stores. So you want to get the list of movies that are not available in any stores. So we need two tables for this. One is film and the other was inventory. So here we're going to use not exist. So we're going to say select star from film. Give me all the films not exist and then your subquery select star from inventory so inventory table has a column film id so we can join the film to the inventory table on film id so it says not exist so this will return me all the films that are not in the inventory table so you can see there's a bunch of movies that are not in any stores. And this is an example of a correlated query as well. So let's take an example of subqueries that are not correlated. So the first one is where we want to get a list of all the payment transactions that are above the average payment amount. So if you look at so if you look at the script, select star from payment where amount, we can just use the operator greater than and then we can use the subquery and in that we just say select average amount from payment. So we're using the same table in the subquery that returns the average amount. And our main query is saying is that select star from payment where amount is greater than the average amount that gets returned from the subquery. So let's run that. So this list gives you all the amounts that are greater than the average amount. The second example is where we want to find out how many stores are in Woodridge. So our main query is select star from store where address in. So we're using the keyword in and we're using the address ID and the subquery is select address ID from we're using the address table and joining it with the city table in our subquery. So the subquery itself has two table that we are joining on city ID where city is Woodridge. So the subquery returns us all the address IDs that exist in Woodridge. And then the main query is pulling data from the store table where the address ID is in this list. So let's run this. So we have one store that is in Woodridge. And you can check that by profiling the individual tables as well. Being able to effectively use string functions become really important in your data analysis. String functions really come handy when you're trying to clean bad data. Having data in a certain format becomes really, really important for companies that get audited on a yearly basis. And string functions can be used to get your data in a particular format. We will go through each of these categories and I'll show you examples of how each function can be used these functions might look overwhelming at first, but I'll try my best to go step by step in explaining how they can be used. We will be looking at the converting category for string functions. And the list of functions are ASCII, CAST, and SOUNDX. So let's go to our lab. So let's say if you're given a task to bring back those customers where the last name is Smith. So we run this simple select like star from customers where last name is equal Smith. So at the first glance, we can say we don't have any records where the last name is Smith. But what if the data quality in your table is not good and somebody has fat fingered the last name, meaning that there are some spelling mistakes. So you will at first glance say we don't have any customers where the last name is Smith. But this is where one of the string functions come handy. You can use the sound X function what this function does is 
it's going to bring back that data that sounds like Smith. It's pretty neat. So we can run the same select, select star from customer where. So we'll use the select star from customer statement where sound X is the name of the function, open bracket, and the name of the column that we want to check equals sound X again and what value we are trying to check against. So it's going to compare the sounds of both of these data points. And if you run this, you get two records back where the last name sounds like Smith. And when you have a lot of data, and let's say you're trying to find a particular name, this type of function will help you return names that sound like a particular given name that you have been tasked to find and will help you in profiling the data in an effective way. The second script is where we want to actually use the cast function which converts data from one data type to the other. So we have select 201010 as value. So we are just using this text value and then we are casting this text value as date time. Basically the function cast uses the value that we are trying to convert and then we use the keyword as and the data type that we want to convert it to. Just giving a label as cast value from dual. Dual is a dummy table in MySQL that can be used to test your functions. So as you can see that the cast function converted the text value 201010 10, into a date time format. So casting can be used when you are ingesting a lot of data that is not standardized, where you want to cast the data into a particular format. It's a very powerful function that gets used a lot as well. In the third script, we will be using an ASCII function. And ASCII functions can be used when you're doing data conversions. So some use cases might ask you to derive an ASCII value. So if we run this script, so basically this is your last name column and it converts it into an ASCII value. I've also given you the ASCII value of an empty screen, which is zero. Formatting string functions are used a lot when writing SQL scripts that lets you manipulate string values. Having a knowledge of formatting string functions will definitely give you an edge. Let's go to our lab section. So let's take the first example. We are tasked to convert the first name and the email address to lower case. So in the script we have first name comma lower, that's the name of the function, open bracket, and then the name of the column you want to change the case to, and then lower case email as well. So we're just going to limit to number of records being five. So if you see the first name was all uppercase in the database so we converted it to lowercase. The email also gets converted to lowercase so it's a pretty simple uh, function. The second script is where we're going to be using a trimming function. Trim function removes spaces from the value. So let's look at the script. So the first column we are concatenating the first name comma and so if you see one two, three, so we have three spaces after the first name and then we are doing the length. What's the length of this once we add three spaces to the first name? Then we're going to use the trim function, right trim first name, so it's going to trim the spaces in the end of the column and then we're going to see the length of the final value. So let's run this. Let's look at the first record. Mary's length is 4 plus 3, its length is 7. But when we use the right trim function, it trims the spaces from the right side of the characters. So here you can see we have used the trim function that trims the spaces from the right. So the third script is where we can be using a padding function. So let's look at the script. Select first name, last name. R pad means right pad, first name comma. So the length of the total output needs to be 15. Third parameter 
is the actual padding value and in our case we're going to be using a dot and then we're also going to write pad the last name so let's run this so we have the first name last name so first name the length of the name is four so there are four characters m a r y it adds 11 dots so the total length becomes 15 and that's what we have we are qualifying it with the length that we need for this field to be at and then we give what we need to use for the padding value so it'll be the the source column the total length of the desired value and what the padding value needs to be in quotes so this is a function that can be used to format a lot of string values string functions can also be categorized under expression extracting and manipulating categories and we're going to be trying out some of the functions in our lab exercises for these in a lot of data projects as being an analyst you'll come across different scenarios where you're given a task to either manipulate the data or either extract some value out of the data so these are the functions that you can use to get your desired results let's try some of these functions in practice so let's take a look at the script one so it's asking us to find the position of character ry in the first name of the customer table so we're going to be using a string function called instring short instr which gives you the position of the character you're trying to find in the string value so let's look at our script so select first name comma instr that's the name of the function open bracket first name that's the name we want to find where the character exists comma ry that's the character we are looking for close brackets from customer I'm using this in the where clause to bring back only those records where the first name does have ry. As this particular function gives you the length, so if the length is greater than zero, that means that the first name does have ry in it. So let's run it. So if you look at the results set, the first record, Mary, so the position from which ry starts from is three, so m a R so R is at the third position if you look at Cheryl it starts at the fourth position R Y right here so this is a string function that can give you a position of a particular character in the data pretty quickly so let's look at script 2 under extracting so we want to use left, right, and mid functions to split the phone number that we have in the address table. So let's look at the script. Select phone, comma, left, open bracket, phone, comma, three. So that means that we are bringing three characters from the left of this value, and we're gonna give it a label as area code. Then we'll do mid. Mid takes two numbers, We'll start at the position 4 and up to the third characters after position 4 would be the mid phone and the right would be we need the rightmost four characters so let's run this so as you can see from the results that we got back is that 998 came into the area code A34 came in the mid phone column 1275 came in the right phone. We'll look at some manipulating string functions in script 3. So let's say if you want to reverse your first name. It's pretty simple and we just use the reverse function and give it the name of the column. So let's run that. So you can see it can easily reverse a string value just by using the reverse function. We can also use a replace function to replace a value in the data. So let's look at the script. Select first name, comma, replace the name of the field, comma, Linda to Lynn. And we'll just give it a label from customer where first name is Linda. So what this does is that it 
finds Linda in this column and replace it with Berlin. Let's run this. You see Linda is replaced by Lynn now. So it's a quick way to replace string values. The last script is basically you can repeat uh, data multiple times by using the repeat function. So let's run this. As you can see, the value is eddy and it's get repeated twice. These are just some examples in which I'm showing you how a string function can be used based on a particular business case. You can use a combination of all these string functions and actually get the desired result. SQL allows you to perform a lot of numeric functions. When we look at our database, we have we might have numeric fields like quantity, paid amounts, or a particular price. So anytime you see numeric data, you can apply these numeric functions. These functions can be categorized in mathematical functions and or arithmetic operators. So if you look at the first table for mathematical functions, we have functions like floor, round, sign. It's pretty simple to apply these mathematical functions that I'll show you in the lab, as well as the arithmetic operators for division, multiplication, and addition. So these operators come really handy whenever we are trying to either add up numeric data or whenever we are trying to apply business rules on these numeric fields. These numeric functions become really, really important. Now let's see these functions in practice. Let's take a look at our first script. So we are applying an absolute function, short ABS, open bracket, and we're giving the value negative two. And we're giving a label as to how we want to see the column name. Comma seal, again, open bracket, and we're giving the actual numeric value. Floor, round, and sign. And we are not giving a particular table, so you can also just use these functions by themselves without giving a table. And MySQL will calculate it. So let's run this. Now the absolute negative 2 brought back 2, which is correct. Ceiling brought back 31 because it's the upper number. Floor got 30, which is correct round got 20 because we are rounding the number from 20.224234 to 20 and sign is basically giving you what the sign of this value is so it's pretty simple to apply these mathematical functions and you can try out your own variations uh, put some different numeric data here and see how the functions behave the second category was arithmetic function. So in our second script, we are doing division. We are also doing subtraction and addition. It's pretty simple. And you can run these with your own variation of numeric data. So result one is one. Result two is one. So we are using div instead of the slash for divide as well. So both can be used and give you the same result. And just a negative sign and a positive. So it's pretty simple. So hopefully you can try out some examples on your own and, and try out both the mathematical functions and the arithmetic operators. Date functions. You either love it or hate it. Date functions become really important when it comes to data that's time sensitive. As data comes from different part of the world, date format becomes an issue. As you can see from this picture, the date formats in different regions of the world is not conforming to one. If you look at the blue colored countries, we start with the day, DD, dash, month, MM, dash, year. So that's kind of a common format. But if you look at the yellow countries, we have the year first. If you look at the countries in red, we have the month first. In the date format, the day, month, and year portion gets interchanged as we look at different parts of the world. So understanding how to format a date field becomes really important. And I can emphasize more that over the course of years, I come across so many occasions where I had to deal with formatting the date data. So hopefully, 
this picture can give you an idea of the different date formats we can get when we're dealing with data that's more international. SQL has a lot of powerful date and time functions. I put together this diagram for you to understand the, the anatomy of the date and time format as it is used in the databases. So if you look at the left of the bar, we have the date portion. So four digit year, two digit month, and two digit day. If you look at the right side of the bar, that's the time portion. So we have two digit hour, two digit minute, two digit second, and then we have milliseconds that can go up to six digits. If you're able to understand this format inside out, you really have an edge on the other analysts. Hopefully in our lab exercise, we'll go through multiple functions that deal with either the date portion or the time portion of this field. The following set of Below is the set of functions we're going to go through in our lab. The set of functions in a lighter green color basically are inbuilt date and time functions that give you whatever the current date is. The second set is basically if you want to extract a certain component of the date back from the data field. The third set, which is the orange color, basically gives you the time portion that you want to extract from your date and time field. And the fourth one, which is highlighted in yellow, is basically a formatting function. It lets you format the date into different flavors. So let's go to our lab exercise to try these out. So let's take a look at script one. We're using the inbuilt date and time function that MySQL gives. So now let's run this uh, script. So current underscore timestamp gives you the date and the time. And remember, we went through the format of the date portion and the time portion of the date and time. So this kind of mimics that. Now also gives you date and time both together. Current date just gives you the date. So it's the year portion then the month and then the day. So it's Y, 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 four Ys, two Ms and two Ds. Current time gives you just the time portion. So these functions are good to remember when you're actually uh, doing your application development as well. So let's look at script two. So we're gonna be using functions that can extract either the year portion, the month or the week or the day portion of a date and time. So let's run our second script. So if you see, we already used the current underscore date function before. So it's just going to give you the date portion. So we have 2018, 10, 20. So if we say year, open bracket, and then use this current date inside the bracket, what this will do is just extract the year. Same thing with quarter, month, week, and day. It's pretty self-explanatory and these functions are named pretty well. So let's say if you want to say day and in the bracket you use the current underscore date, it's just going to pull that today is the 20th day. Same thing with week, month, quarter, and year. And these functions become really important in reporting when business is asking you to split the date and tell you what the quarter is, what the month is, what the week is for their sales data. So really, really important. It's really good to know these functions that can drive and isolate the year, quarter, month, week, and day. Very helpful. Let's look at script three. So now we're using functions that can extract the time portion and dissect the time down to hour, minute, and second. So now we're going to use the current underscore time function to give us the current time and then these additional functions that will drive the hour, the minute, and the second. Same thing what we did with the current date. We're going to use the hour, minute, and second and then in the brackets we're going to give the current time. If you look at the current time, it's 11.52.58. So it takes the hour out, the minute out, and the seconds and you know these functions will become important if for some compliance reasons you want to know the minute 
of your transaction when it was paid or you want to know the hour or you want to know the second these granular attributes become very very important now we're going to look at the the current timestamp which is the date and the time portion together so let's run this so if you see the current time we have 2018 10 20 and then the time portion so date underscore format can be used for date and time values so let's say you have your date and time value right here right now we're using our current timestamp but in production systems you will get an actual date and time value so you need to place that here first and comma if you see these letters percentage k percentage i s d m and y these are predefined letters that depict like percentage k depicts it's an hour i depicts it's a minute s second d day m month and y year so this is something that you just have to remember just make sure you remember that date underscore format function takes two parameters one is the actual date and time and the other is actually what element you want to extract when you look at the result set we are able to extract the hour the minute the second and the day month and years this is an important function as well let's say you get the current date and time and you're asked by the reporting analyst to tell you what week it is what day is it not just numerically but from a textual perspective if it's a saturday if it's a monday how would you go about driving that so let's take a look at this script so we are using the date underscore format and we're going to use now if you look at these predefined uh, letters here so percent w will tell you the weekday name percent m is going to be month name percent e is going to be day of the month percent y is going to be the year then the time portion h is hour i is minute and p is am or pm so if you see we got the date and time here then so we're seeing it's a saturday the month is october 20th is the date 2018 and then the actual time and then if it's a pm or an am so as you can see this derived date and time is more descriptive and sometimes for your reporting you would need that you, you would want to convert a date and time from this format down to here so just remember that these are predefined letters that are used in the SQL function this is something that you have to remember and hopefully as you practice more these functions will become very very easy for you to understand date functions either help you add or subtract date and or time from the date field these sets of date functions become important when we have more timeline oriented data that's needed. These sets of date and time function helps you move along the timeline either by adding days, months, years, or subtracting them to get the desired result. Let's go use them in practice. So let's look at script one. There are a lot of times when we are asked to either add or subtract a certain number of days from the date fields. This activity is really important as we're trying to report a certain metrics. You might come across some use cases where you might either have to subtract or add days or months to a particular date field, and it might be for some reporting need. So let's look at uh, the script. Select current date and then we're adding five days to the current date and then just giving a label so let's run this script so you see we added five days so it's 2018 10 25 to add the days you you need to use the keyword interval and then the number of days you want to add and then the grain of what you want to add in this case it's the day we want to add let's look at the next example we can achieve a similar result by using the add date function as well so add date takes two parameters the first is the actual date field that you want to add to comma and then we can use internal five days so this should give us the same result as well so it's added five days so if you're asked to take days out we can use the negative sign and say interval 10 days so it will take it will deduct 10 days from the current date 
So see it's 10, 10. Like adding days, we can either add or subtract months. So let's say if you want to subtract 10 months from today. So you see it's 12, 17, 12, 20. Likewise, the year portion. We can also take 10 years out of the date. It's giving us 2008. Pretty nice handy functions. So now let's apply these date and time function to our database. So we have a payment table, which has a payment date column. We want to list out the month and the total number of transactions for the customers in that month. So let's look at the script. So select payment date as paid date. So that's our field in the table. Month name is going to extract the month from this date field and actually extract if it's January, February, March. And then we're doing a count. We want number of transactions from payment. We have to use the group by. So we want to group it by payment date, but only the month portion of the payment date. And then we're just ordering by the count. So we want basically the first record should show the most number of transactions and it should go descending. So let's run this. So you see from the results set, July has the highest amount of transactions, then August, June, May, and then February. So looking at this data, the store can actually see that July's are mostly the busiest time for movie rentals and they can actually add more resources in their stores. And which one are the least uh, busiest months? And this can impact the business directly. So knowing the date functions can really help business decipher the type of data you have in your database. Let's say if you're asked to produce an average number of days a customer holds a movie for viewing. So to calculate the average number of days a customer holds a movie, first we need to get the difference between the return date and the rental date. So how many days actually the customer holds the movie. So the first script just gives you that. You can see that these are the number of days a customer is holding the movie. Now, and we are using the date diff function to calculate the difference. Now to calculate the average, we just use the average function. So the average number of days a customer holds a movie is five. So if you want to know which day the customer rents the most of the movies, so we want to find out which day of the week customers are renting the most movie. So let's look at our script for this. Select day name from rental date. It's just going to give you if it's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, count the number of movies rented from rental. Again, we have to group by the rental date. So if you look at this data, Tuesday seems to be the day when we have the most amount of movies being rented. In a summary, date time functions play a really important role in your data analysis journey. Time after time again, you will come across situations where you have to use the date and time functions. So my advice would be is to go through these exercises a few times, use different data, and try to get used to these date and time functions. Conditional logic in SQL can be applied using a case statement. It's similar to an if-then-else statement if you've used any other programming language. Case statement can help you transform data from one set of values to the other, and also it can help you prevent errors if you're doing some sort of a calculation. Now let's look at the syntax. We'll use the keyword case to start the case statement, then give the particular column whose value we want to evaluate, when the value, then whatever value we want to use to transform that. We can have multiple conditions by using the when and then keywords. Else, if none of those conditions are met, we can give a particular data value at point and then end case. Else is optional. Let's look at the case statement in practice. Let's use the case statement on the films table. So let's see what we have in the table first. So we have a title and a rating. So what we want to do is we want to basically 
expand on the rating acronym and give a description. So what we can use is a case statement to actually enhance these acronyms and let our users know what they mean. So if you look at the first script, we're using the case keyword, then we are giving the column we want to transform. And in this case, it's going to be rating when, and then the value of this column. So if the value of the column is R, then we're going to change it to restricted. So these are multiple conditions when and then that can be applied to change these acronyms to, to more descriptive information. And then we use else. If none of these conditions are met, then else condition is going to be triggered. And as and we're going to give it a label for this column as movie rating description. And also order it by title. So we want to order it ascending. So let's run this. So looking at the results set, if you see PG, I had a condition where if rating was PG, then transform it to parental guidance suggested. So you see this new column is actually giving us the transformed value. So this case statement can become really, really important when you're doing migration from one platform to the other. And there are some requirements where you want to change values based on a particular business requirement. So you see all the acronyms have been successfully transformed. So there's another flavor in which we can use the case statement. The script that we ran, we were using the column after the case. What we can also do, if you look at our second script, is case when the column equals R, then transform is to restricted. And here we are listing the column in each of these conditions and then assigning a particular transformation rule to it. Both of these will give us the same result set. Hopefully you'll find these examples helpful. Window functions are one of the coolest features I think uh, SQL has. Once you know the mechanics of working with window functions, you can use it for different use cases and calculate the desired metrics. The windowing process lets you divide the result set into groups of rows called partitions. And then frames let you operate on even a subset of partition data by breaking partitions into smaller sequences of rows. There are a lot of functions that can be applied via the windowing concept. Some of the use cases that can use the window function, if you want to calculate the top 10 products this year by total sales, if you want to calculate moving averages or running totals, we will go through some scenarios where you can see how window functions can be used. You can apply the window function on a particular column while still maintaining the detail of the whole table. Like if you remember in our group by functions, we used to get data that used to condense the number of records based on the group by column. But with window functions, you can still maintain the detailed set of records of the table and still apply grouping on the data based on different aggregate functions. So the windowing concept becomes really important when you're trying to see the data in its totality. Next, we'll see how the window function is constructed and what are the components that make a window function work. Let's review the components of the window function. You can apply your regular aggregate functions through the windowing logic, like use your average, min, max, sum, and rank functions and many more. The expression list is where we have the column indicated on which the function runs. Window functions are initiated with the over class. Partition by list specifies dividing the rows into groups. You can also control the order in which the rows are processed by the window functions using the order by class, ascending or descending. Rows and range frame clause allows us to operate on a subset of the partitions by breaking the partition into even smaller sequences of rows. The frame clause lets you limit the number of rows within a partition by specifying a start and end point. 
Let's try to expand the row and range capability of the rendering function. The additional framing clause uses either a row or a range and then sets up a boundary using the between clause. These expressions can fall into different categories of being either unbounded preceding, unbounded following, and few others. If you look at the diagram, the unbounded preceding and the unbounded following represents the first row of the partition and then the last row of the partition. So that kind of sets the boundary. You can also set a custom boundary by giving an offset for number preceding and number following from the current row. The default frame is range between unbounded preceding and current row. Range clause treats the duplicate values as single entity versus row clause uses them as separate. Row frames are based on physical offsets and range frames are more logical in nature. We will look at more examples which will make the difference between row and range frames much more clearer. The following categories give you the list of functions that can be used in the windowing logic. So you can use aggregates, ranks, functions for statistics, distribution, and also positional activities. So these functions become really handy once used via the windowing logic. We're going to start with using the aggregate functions in our lab now. We'll start with creating the employee table and insert some data. And some of you might have already done that in the previous lab. All right, so we have employee ID, employee names, the department that they work in, their salary, and their age. So that's the data we are working with. So let's start with finding the total salary per department, right? So you know from the previous lecture, we can use a group by department name to get the total salary by summing it up. Here you can see the group by clause has grouped each department and summed up the total salary. Let's say you want to calculate the average and the total sum of all the salaries in the table presented in a way that the actual number of records in the table still show when you run the query. For that, you're going to use the over clause which initiates the windowing process. So we're going to do the aggregate function of sum, pass in the column that we want to aggregate on, then the over clause, and let's give it a label. Same thing with the average. We're going to give it the column name, over clause, and the label and just run the script. So as you can see, we got all our records in the employee table. Employee ID, employee name, department name, and salary. So we have 11 records showing up. But if you look at the last two columns, the total salary and the average salary. So what this over clause did was summed up all the salaries of all employees and listed it at every row along with the average salary at every row. Our third script is asking us to sum up the amounts for Mary and Barbara where each amount they paid is greater than $5. So for that we have to join the customer table and the corresponding payment table. So we're going to join those two tables on customer ID we're still using the where clause where amount is greater than five and the name is Mary and Barbara. So if you look at our select statement, we want to know which month they paid these amounts in. We're summing up the amount and then using the over clause and then giving a total payment. So let's run this. Here you can see the Mary's transactions. In June, she had two transactions that were greater than $5. In July, she had three transactions, but if you look at the total payment, the over function is adding up all these amounts and showing it at each row, sum of all these amounts together. So this kind of shows you the aggregation being shown with the detailed records. Our fourth script is a little variation from the third script. In script three, we were not grouping or partitioning the windowing function, but here we're going to introduce a partitioning clause and we're going to partition by each customer. So we're going to partition by Mary and then we're going to partition by Barbara. So the script is pretty much the same. The only difference we have is that when we sum the amount and use the over clause, in the over clause, open bracket, we're going to use the partition by clause and we're going to partition by customer ID. 
let's see the results. If you see now, so the total amounts are aggregated by the customer. So all of Mary's amounts have been totaled up and all of Barbara's amount have been totaled up. This partition by clause comes really handy when we want to partition on a particular column using the windowing function. So you can see the total amounts here, $41.94, only relate to Mary Smith's transaction when you sum these up. Great. I've added a slide to explain these results further. Calculating the total payment amount for each customer and showing the detailed records alongside it. So if you see, we summed the amount and used the over clause and then used partition by customer ID and labeled as total payments. So if you look at the last column, using the partition by clause created two partitions in our result set, one for Mary and one for Barbara. And by using the partition keyword, you're able to isolate your aggregate functions to be only applied on that partition. Hopefully this visual was helpful. In our fifth script, we want to calculate the total and average salary per department and list the total employees per department as well. You had seen the employee table. We had employee name, department, and salary and their age. We're going to use the over clause. We can also use the partition by, we're going to partition by departments. So, so here you can see the first three records relate to the HR department. Salaries are here. So the total salary per department. So this 12,900 is the sum of these three salaries in the HR department because we partition by department name. Likewise, the average salary per department and the total employees. So we have three employees. Now let's take a scenario where we want to calculate the running sum of the paid amounts per month by customer where the each transaction is greater than $5 for Mary and Barbara. So the script remains the same. The only portion that will change is that we're going to add the order by paid month clause after the partition by customer ID. So what this does is that it further segments out the data by month after it has already grouped by the customer ID. So let's run this. If you look at Mary's transactions, we have months six, seven, and eight. So we have three months in which the transactions are split. So for month of June, this windowing function added up the two transactions for the month of June. Then it came and added the transactions for the month of June plus the month of July. So 35.95 is adding transactions for all the month of July and June. The last transaction for Mary for the month of August is $41.94. So it adds $5.99 to the $35.95 calculate in the previous row. So $45.94 is the total for all these amounts for all these months as well. It's a running total as it keeps adding the transaction amounts as the current row moves down. If you don't specify a row and range and give a particular boundary, the default is range between unbounded preceding and current row. Let's try to understand this through a visual aid. So when we use the windowing function and do the order by payment month, if we don't use any range or don't set any boundaries, by default, MySQL will process this as a range clause and then do between unbounded preceding and current row. If you look at the results set, if the order by value is the same, in this case for the month of July, we have three transactions, range would calculate the aggregation for that block of data together. And that's why you see $35.95 being repeated for each row for the month of July as the calculation happens on that logical group. Hopefully this visual will help you differentiate between a row and a range calculation. Now let's update the previous script 
and add another rendering function where we are actually explicitly saying rows between unbounded proceeding and the current after the order by clause and leave the other running total payment range as is. Let's run this. So the running total payment rows, what it does is that it adds the amounts row by row. It's like a physical row gets added to the total amount. It does not matter if the month is the same, but if you compare the range running total, if it sees the month being the same, it adds the total amounts and give the same amount on those two rows. Then it comes to the month of July, it add all the July and the previous. The difference between rows and range is that the order by clause does not impact the row calculation and it basically works its aggregation on each row as it goes through. On the other hand, range basically logically groups based on the order by and calculates the total sum based on the order by column. Let's look at the rows calculation through a visual aid. So the moment we use the rows keyword, the framing happens at each row. So as rows are being added, the frame gets bigger. As you can see from the visual on the right side that the frame one through frame six is an increment from the first row to the last row. So as the frame goes bigger, the total sum or the running sum gets added as the current row goes down to the last row of Mary's transaction and likewise with Barbara. Now let's say if we want to calculate a moving sum, meaning that a sliding window that goes through our set of records. We'll keep the rest of the script the same. We'll still use the sum of the amount over clause partitioned by customer ID and the order of the month remains the same. So this information we are not changing. We're going to add rows between and give a boundary of one preceding and current row. Likewise, we can also add the range between one preceding and current row and see how our calculations are different between rows and range. Let's run the script. If you look at our rows column, so moving total payment rows paid amount one day. So we have a one day prior sliding window. So now we have $5.99, so we don't have any prior row. It's just going to represent $5.99. As you go to the next column, it's going to add one previous amount and this amount and put $15.98. As it moves forward, it's just going to only add one previous amount. Because if you look at the last row, the reason why we have $13.98 is because it, it added $5.99 to $7.99. So it's a sliding window with one month prior by using the row between one preceding and current row. If you look at the range calculation, it again summed up the two amounts based on the payment month. So for the month of June, we have $15.98 as it went through the next set of month, it added again for the month of July. So it added July payments to the June payments, but it repeats it for the same month. So if you look at the last row of Mary and look at the total moving payment range payment one day, it's $25.96. The reason it is $25.96 is because it added $5.99 to these three transactions in July. So knowing the difference between rows and range calculation becomes really helpful as you start doing your analysis. Let's look at the sliding effect using the rows clause through a visual aid. So this slide is showing you a moving total payment for each customer by month. And we are able to achieve that by setting up a boundary and by saying rows between one preceding and current. And if you look at the framing, it basically has two rows as it moves through their data set. And it's called a sliding window. If we would have used between two preceding and current, the window would have had at the most three records as it's moving through the table. Positional window function 
helps navigate data location in a result set and are helpful in business reporting. Lag and lead functions let you either access the data before the current row or after the current row, depending on the offset you give. First value and last value gives you either the first or the last value in an ordered set. Let's look at these functions in practice. So what script one is doing is, is calculating the first and the last value of the employee ID partitioned by department name. So it's a pretty simple script and it give you the first employee and the last employee. So if you see, we are getting frame first row, we are getting the first employee here and frame last row, we are getting the last employee here, which is Grace Lee. Pretty simple, straightforward function. Let's try to run script two, which is calculating the lag and the lead function over the employee ID partitioned by department name and ordered by ID. So we are ordering it by ID. So let's run that. If you look at the HR department, we have three employees. So for the first employee, there's no previous row. If you don't give an offset or a default value for lag and lead, so it's gonna basically set the offset by one record. So lag would be one record before and lead would be one record after. So the next row, which is using the lead function is gonna be two and three from the current row, so it just gives you that. For the third employee in this particular partition, there's no next record and it's gonna be null. But if you use the offset for the lead function, like in this case, I've used two, that means that the function would fetch record from two rows down. So when you're on the first row on employee one, two records down would be Grace Lee, so we are getting three here for the lead with setting an offset of two. But there are no records after two records from two. That's why we're getting null, null. By using the lead and lag offset, you can really navigate the data that you have in the table within the partition. So for every new partition, the window function would start again. Ranking is another category of windowing functions that gets used a lot. Rank functions can be used to calculate the top number of records in a data set. Rank functions assign the same ranks to equal rows versus dense rank that has no gaps, hence the term dense. Entile slices the data into the given number of subdivisions you give, and row number just gives a physical number to each row in your partition. Let's see these functions in practice. I really like rank functions, so we're gonna be using the employee table for running our rank examples. I want to update one of the salary records for employee 5 so we can see the difference between the rank and dense rank. Please run that update statement. Right, for script 1, we want to calculate the rank and dense rank on the salary of the employee. So we're going to use the keyword rank, open and close bracket, over partition by department name. So for every department, I want to rank the salary. Same thing I want to do with dense rank, dense underscore rank, open and close bracket, over partition by department and order by salary. So I want the ranking by salary within a department. So let's run this. So if you see HR gets one, two, three rank and dense rank one, two, three. So far rank and dense rank is giving us the same ranks. Let's go to production department. If you look, the first row of production gets both ranks as one. Second and third gets two because the salary is the same. But the fourth record with rank function gets four and dense rank gets three. So here you can see there's a gap in the rank function. It's skipping three, but the dense rank does not skip. And there are no gaps when using the dense rank. And so it systematically says one, two, two, three, and four. On the other hand, rank says one, two, two, four, and five. So I prefer using dense ranks for this reason. Let's say if you want to calculate the top five employees by salary. What we can do is we can apply the dense rank function, use the over clause, and just order by salary descending. So we want the highest salary first 
and lowest at the bottom. And we are not partitioning by department right now because we just want the top five salaries regardless of the department. So we are using an inline SQL right here. So if you look at the brackets, this particular select is giving you a dense rank for the highest salary is one and then kind of goes down all the way down to eight. But we are looking for the top five employees. So we need to filter this data further. So to filter the SQL inside, we will use another SQL outside this and keep the SQL in close brackets, give it an alias. So the whole script inside will get an alias of X. So we'll say select star from the inner SQL alias X where salary underscore dense rank is less than or equal to five, which is filter these records where salary dense rank is less than or equal to five. So if we run that, we should get the top five employees by salary. There you go. So it's a handy way of getting an N number of people within a group based on a particular metric. Let's look at script two. We want to basically use the N tile function to split the payment data of the customers into four groups. How are we going to do that? So we're going to use an N tile function, open bracket four. Basically, this gives you how many slices you need of the data over, which initiates the window function, order by the amount descending as quartile. And we're going to join the payment and the customer table on the customer ID. So basically, we want to see the amounts paid by the customer and then group them into four distinctive groups. Let's run this. If you look at the quartile column, it's assigning these rows group one. If you scroll down to records, we have some records assigned as two, some as three, and then four. So this is an easy way to categorize the number of records in your table to a particular given group using the ntile function and giving a particular number of groups you need in this parentheses right here. In script three, we're going to be calculating the top earning employee per department. So for every department, I want the highest paid employee. We're going to use the row underscore number function, partition the data by department name, and then order the salary descending. We, row numbers basically assign just a number to each physical row. If we run the script highlighted on the screen, we're going to get a sequential number assigned to each row in our employees table. So for HR department, we are getting one, two, three, and then the ordering is based on salary descending. The way we can filter this record and only bring records where the employee rank is equal to one, we need to have an outer SQL, select star from, open brackets and close bracket where we have the inline SQL, give it an alias X, where employee rank equals one. So let's run this. So this gives us the highest paid employees in each department based on the salary. Hopefully these examples help you understand the ranking functions. One of the reasons why I added the data visualization section to this course is that as a data analyst, you would be asked to present your data findings in a very concise and impactful way so the business can understand the value of your analysis along with the key metrics that impact their business. Think of data visualization as a tool for communication. One of the best ways to explore and try to understand large data sets is through data visualization. The concept of storytelling is how we set the stage to showcase our data so it can be understood without going into too much technical details. And with data volumes going up, business is leaning more and more towards leveraging data visualization to better educate them on either discovering patterns, spotting trends, and highlighting information where there are opportunities to improve. The goal of all data-centric organizations is to make better data-driven decisions, which would lead to better insight and that would ultimately drive business. Aesthetics of data visualization becomes very important as we start using visualization to communicate the message. 
Aesthetics described every aspect of a given graphical element. So like position, which describes where the element is located. So location becomes important as you showcase your visualization. Shape can be used to show different data sets. Size can show magnitude. Color can show intensity. Lines with varying width and type can show patterns. So all these small intricacies can help your data visualization be more impactful. And we'll see a lot of examples in the other slides. Once we get our hands on a data set, the first step is to understand the type of data values we want to visualize. The two categories in which data values can be split is categorical and numerical. Categorical is more qualitative and is further split into either nominal or ordinal. Nominal categories don't have a particular order and is used for more labeling purposes. Examples are either eye color or gender. So for instance, gender might have values of M as male and then F for female. Ordinal values are more ordered. Ordinal data, as the name suggests, has a certain order to it. So customer survey might have data values as one being satisfied, two being neutral, and three being unsatisfied. Numerical category is more quantitative. It can be further split into either discrete or continuous. Quantitative values can be measured. Discrete data set, for instance, can take only a certain value. For example, the number of people in a room can either hold six or seven people, but not 5.5. So the examples are the number of sides you have for a dice and the number of pages in a book. Continuous data set is where the data can be split into further slices, and it's more like infinite. Continuous data values are for which you can divide them into finer and finer increments. So for instance, a temperature or a weighing scale, you can further subdivide the weight into smaller units. So it's more or less infinite, it's continuous. The distinction of data into these groups will become really, really important as we start to use different types of charts and graphs, which we'll see in the later slides. Hopefully this visual will help you understand how we need to think of data before we start putting the data into a more visual form. You might be faced with a particular situation where you need to present your data based on a specific requirement that can either be categorized as comparing the data values or showing composition of your data set or presenting how data is distributed or it is related. For each of these categories, we have a set of charts and graphs that can be used to deliver the desired results. I'm showing a condensed list of chart types within these categories on this slide. We will go through each of these chart types in detail in the later slides. I've attached a chart selection diagram to the lecture notes created by Dr. Andrew Abella that is pretty elaborate and will help you pick the right chart for your data type. An important question you can ask before selecting a visualization is, how many variables do you want to show in a single chart? Is it one, two, three, or more? And how many data points do you want to display for each variable? And will you display values over a period of time or among items or groups? Answer to these questions will help you pick the right chart for your visualization. We will use the Tableau software for our data visualization course. There are many other data visualization tools in the market, but Tableau by far is one of the leaders. If you follow the link given in the slide, it will take you to a public version of Tableau, which is free of cost. You can download it either for Windows or Mac version. The only downside is that you cannot save your visualization on the desk. You can only save it online on Tableau's public portal. So this is only good for testing or university-based assignments. You don't want to share sensitive data on the public website. We're going to first install Tableau on the Mac OS. So just give in an email address.
we have successfully installed Tableau on macOS. Let's install Tableau public version on Windows. Great, our software has been installed. We have two data sets we're going to use during the course. One would be the World Indicator data set, the other one is going to be the Sample Superstore data set. You have no dimensions or measures and pretty much you have a blank canvas at this point. So what you want to do is you want to click on this Connect to Data to get those two data sets loaded. So we'll go to Excel because we have those data sets in Excel. We need to link to these two data sets. So we'll go first to the World Bank CO2 Excel sheet and load it. Once you're connected to the Excel sheet, it's going to show you the tabs that you have in your Excel worksheet. You're going to click on the CO2 data clean and double click that. Great. So we have actually successfully connected to the World CO2 Excel sheet. You have your country code, country name, region, year, your CO2 emission, and your per capita information. So now if you go, click on the sheet one, we should have the dimensions and measures loaded. Great, so we have those two. Now we need to connect to the second data set. So click on the data source here. Click on this icon. We're going to connect to Excel, Sample Superstore Excel. Great, so we're able to look at these tabs that are in that Excel sheet. So we're going to double click on the orders. So this is the data set that we're going to be connecting to is the order data. Let's go to sheet one. Now you see we have the CO2 data connected and also the Superstore data connected as well. So you'll see dimensions and measures for the Superstore data set. And if we click on the world CO2 data set, we're seeing the dimensions and measures related to that data set. As an exercise, you can connect to the world indicators data set on your own. Great. So we have the data now. Bar charts are one of the most commonly used visualization that shows numeric values as bars split across clear categories. They are effective in comparing magnitudes and discovering high and low in the data. And that is shown by the height of the bars. Bar chart is sometimes called column charts. You can either show data on a vertical or a horizontal bar. And let's say if you have more categories or labels, it at times becomes harder to show that vertically. And we have the option to show them horizontally. X-axis show the dimensions and Y-axis show the measures. Bar charts discrete data is categorical in nature and therefore answers the question how many within each of these categories. Let's take a look at the anatomy of the bar chart. If you look at the diagram, the horizontal axis has the categories or dimensions and the vertical axis has the measures. The height of the bar is showing the magnitude and the width of the bar is the same across and you read from left to right. Each bar shows a particular category. This visualization is very easy to understand. This visualization becomes very impactful when you can see the variations in the height of the bar. We have another variation of the traditional bar chart that's called the stack bar chart. Here you see the same bar chart and the only difference is that each bar is further segmented out into subcategories. This becomes effective when you have a hierarchy in the category. So let's say you have a region and then the region is split further into two to three different subregions. So this is an effective way to show those subregions within a bar. A stack bar chart show a finer details on the data set as the data can be seen split in further categories. Let's go to Tableau and create these charts. 
For this exercise, we will connect to a World Indicator dataset. Click on Microsoft Excel, and you need to open the World Indicator dataset. So it's connecting right now. So what Tableau does is that it lets you see the data once you connect to it in a browser format. So you can see what, what data you have. You can also improve the quality of data if you want to change a particular value once you see it. But for us, we're going to use the data as is. Let's go to sheet one. So now you can see that the dimensions and measures have been filled up based on the data set. So our first task is to show how the inbound dollar amount is increasing per year uh, in our data set. So double click on the year. So we have data from 2000 to 2012. Double click tourism inbound, which is a measure. Go to show me and we'll select the horizontal bars. So you can see that the inbound tourism has been increasing worldwide. You can also switch the chart from horizontal to vertical by clicking on this icon. Great, so we have our first chart. If you look at this plus sign, we can create a new sheet. So we'll just do add. So we'll do the same thing. We'll double click on the year. We'll double click on the tourism inbound. Double click on the region. Now in the show me, we need to click on the stack bar chart. Great. So now you can see we are able to create a stack bar chart where each bar shows total inbound dollar amount spent per each segment. And in this case, our segment is the region. You can see Europe is leading in each of these years in tourism. And Africa is increasing over the years, but compared to Europe is still far less. Great, so this is a stack bar chart. We'll create a third chart. You can create a duplicate version of an existing sheet by clicking on the duplicate option in the menu. And this will be a side by side bar chart. I really like this visualization. What it's showing is that each region is shown in a column and you have the number of years for the data for inbound dollar amounts showing. What we can do is instead of the year being on the color palette, we can replace that by region. So each region has its own color. Now let's try to add a dashboard. So dashboard would be this icon right here. You can combine multiple worksheet in a single dashboard. We can drag the sheet on the pan and you'll see how the dashboard actually puts the sheet side by side. This really becomes a very powerful communication tool in your presentations. We will make few modifications to the dashboard. First, we will rename the worksheets to have a more descriptive name that goes along with the chart it's representing. Second, on our sheet one, we will change the color of the bar chart to have a more neutral tone. Third, we will adjust the size of the dashboard appropriately. Let's go make those updates. So click on the color. We'll just pick a gray. Great. I have renamed the three sheets with the desired names. You can do that on your side as well by right clicking on the sheet you want to change the name for and select rename from the menu selection. So you have your layout and your dashboard, then you have the size. It's an automatic size, but you can increase so you can increase the width or decrease the width. You can decrease the height if you want. So this kind of gives you an easy way to minimize or expand the size. Now you can see these three visualizations in a dashboard, which really gives you a compelling story. My favorite is the total inbound tourism per region detail. So it basically gives you each region and the way inbound tourism dollar amount is increasing. If you can see, Asia has had the sharpest increase 
over the years and also Europe is leading by far. The total inbound tourism just gives us a total picture of how every year the dollar amount on the tourism is increasing and the stack bar chart kind of gives you how each segment within the year for the region is compared. So this kind of gives you an overall dashboard that can be used to show different perspectives of how the inbound tourism in the world can be compared among different regions. Hopefully this was helpful. Line charts are like time series graph. They are used to visualize data trends over an interval of time. The data points on the chart are connected through a straight line showing numeric values plotted as lines over date related fields. The difference between the bar chart and the line chart is that the line chart needs to include time dimension in it. We will also be using stacked area chart which can also show time series data. Its main purpose is to show individual parts and how they make up the whole or the total. Let's see these charts in action using Tableau. We will be connecting to the World Indicator dataset. So click on Microsoft Excel and open the dataset. Great, we got connected. Let's go to Sheet 1. All right, so our dimension and measures have been loaded. So what we need to calculate is the, the total CO2 emission over the period of time and show which region is showing a spike in the CO2 emission and where we have a dip. Let's add the dimension year, double click on the dimension, add the measure CO2 emission, double click on that as well, and then double click on the region as well. So if you see, we have a tabulated form of data here. It's really hard to see a dip or a peak on the CO2 based on the region. So we really need to get a visualization on this data to make some sense quickly. So you click on the show me drop down and pick the line chart. So this line chart really becomes an impactful communication tool where you can see Asia by far from 2002 has a peak, meaning the CO2 emissions have been going up quite significantly from 2002 and onwards for the region of Asia compared to the other regions. Let's create a new worksheet for our stacked area chart. Click on the plus sign. We'll pick the same dimension and measures. Double click on year, double click on CO2 emission, and then double click on the region. Click on the show me drop down and pick the area chart. Great. So the area chart is showing the total summed up CO2 emission in the world and it's doing it by stacking each region on top of each other. This chart becomes helpful to see the bigger picture. Now let's try to put these two charts on our dashboard. By clicking the plus icon, we can just drag and drop these two sheets on the pen. Great. You can change the size of the dashboard based on your own need. We'll just expand it so it fills up the screen. Let's try to rename these two worksheets. Do the same for the next sheet. Edit title. Great, now we have our dashboard ready to be presented. Histogram shows the frequency of distribution of your continuous data. It divides the data set into clear groups called bins. The frequency of the bin data becomes the measure of the histogram and gets calculated automatically. Histogram uses one dimension that is numerical, which gets split into bins. Histograms can also be useful to visualize the outliers in your data set. In our past visualization with bar charts, the columns were showing categorical variable. In histogram, the columns show quantitative variable. If you look at the anatomy of the histogram, on the x-axis you have fixed size bins where your numerical data gets grouped. There are no gaps between the bars as the data is continuous. On the y-axis we have frequency of the bin data and the height of the bar is showing how many number of records you have
for a bit so it shows the magnitude. We will be creating two histograms, one for sales data and the other for profit from our Superstore data set. Let's see these in practice. Let's connect to the Superstore data set. Bring the orders to the pan. Great, so we have the data. Let's go to sheet one. We have to look at the sales measure and find the frequency of the distribution for this data set. So what we need to do, we need to create bins of the sales data. We need to figure out what size of the bins do we need. For this exercise, I'm gonna pick the bin size as 10. Click on the sales measure, click on the drop down. There's a small icon on the right side. Click on the create and then click on bins. There's a default bin size. You can go ahead, overwrite it. The moment you create a bin for the sales data, the binned data goes into the dimension. We need to change the type of this data to be continuous. You can click on the drop down and click convert to continuous. Double click on the sales bin. Great, so you got that on the column. On the row, we need to actually count the number of records we have for the sales data. So we'll just write count bracket number of records, close bracket. Just hit enter. Great, so we got our histogram. What we need to do is we need to filter out some of the sales data. You can do this by dragging the sales to the filter pan and you'll get this window. Click all values. You can reduce the maximum value to about 600. You can either type in the window or just drag the slider. Hit apply. Great, so now we can see our histogram. And as you can see that majority of the concentration of the values is between zero to 50. If you look at the tallest bin, that has the maximum number of records in it. So what we can do is we can label it. Just do a right click, mark label, always on. So it shows you the number of records we have in that bin. Great. Let's create a new worksheet. Now we'll create the histogram with the profit measure. We'll again pick the bin size for profit. I will pick 100 as a bin size. Now you need to change the bin into a continuous variable. Double click on it so it shows on the column. And on the row, you need to do a count number of records. Great, so we got our profit histogram. What we need to do is we need to filter the profit between negative 1,000 to positive 1,000. You can do this by moving the profit to the filter pan and you'll get a window open. Click all values. Now you can give a range between negative 1,000 to positive 1,000 and you can type it in the small window. Hit apply. Now we can see the majority of the transactions are between zero to hundred dollars. And you can label the bar with the highest number of records. As you move to the right and the left of the highest bar, you will see that the number of records in those bins go down quite a bit. Let's try to add these two histograms into our dashboard by clicking the plus sign. You can just double click or just drop those two sheets into the pan. You can rename both the worksheets to a more appropriate label. And whenever you are showing a histogram, always try to mention the bin size on your diagram. We can rename sheet two as well by right clicking and edit title. You can adjust the size of your dashboard as well. Great, there you have scatter plots show relationship between two measures, one plotted on the x-axis 
and the other on the y-axis. Scatterplots can show a large number of data points and is suited to drive actionable insight. Unlike bar graphs, which uses the length as a visual clue, scatterplots use position, x and y coordinate. Scatterplots can help show correlation between variables, positive and negative, and can depict clusters within your data points. If you look at the anatomy of the scatter plot, it's basically made up of an X and Y coordinate, and both axes have measures listed on them. This type of visualization helps you capture a lot of data points in a very efficient manner. In our lab, we'll be creating a scatter plot between profit and sales data of the Superstore data set. Also, identifying clusters within this data set by color coding it, it'll be fun. This slide shows two plots, one showing a positive correlation between birth date and infant mortality, meaning if one variable goes up, the other goes as well, hence positive. The other shows negative correlation between life expectancy of females to birth rate. As one goes up, the other comes down, hence negative. The correlation scatter plots will be added at a later time, and you can do this on your own and see if you get the desired results. For now, we'll go to the lab and create a scatter plot for our Superstore dataset. Let's connect to the dataset Superstore. Click on the Orders tab. Click on the new worksheet. All right, so we have to get two measures, profit and sales, on the pan. Double click on those two. So now you see that we have an aggregated point where all the profit and sales have been aggregated. We need to uncheck this aggregation by going to analysis and unchecking the aggregate measures selection. Great. So now we have a spread of all our profit and sales data in a scatter plot. As you can see, we are able to show a lot of data points. Our end goal is to find the clusters of customers we have in our data set. We can drag the customer name to the details marks card. Now what we need to do is go to the Analysis tab. And you can see in the model you have the cluster option. Just drag that and drop it on the pan. Great. You can see Tableau, based on its k-mean algorithm, has clustered our data set into three distinctive clusters. Cluster 1, 2, and 3. And they are color-coded for distinction. Our cluster 1, as you can see, we have a lot of customers there, but the profit is minimal. In cluster 2, you can see we have customers where we're making a lot of profit, much better than cluster 1. So that's definitely one cluster you want to focus on for your sales. Cluster 3 is where we have very few customers, but on each customer, we are making a much larger profit margin. We can also move the cluster from the marks card to the dimension. And what we'll do is it'll create a customer group that can be used later on another visualization. Let's create a new worksheet. Let's bring in latitude and longitude and the postal code for the customers. This will show us where all our customers are in, in North America. Now what we need to do is we need to drag the customer group that we made from the clustering into the filter and select which cluster we want to see on our map. Now you can see we can select clusters and the map is going to get updated based on the selection of the cluster we pick. So if we want to target marketing based on a certain cluster, we can see where they are. You can drag the customer group to the colors marks card. Looking at these clusters on a map really gives a powerful visualization for us to do our targeted marketing and seeing which cluster has a better impact and which location needs to be focused more. Let's add our scatter plot to the dashboard. Let's rename it. Great. People just either love pie charts or just hate them. I'm not too fond of them. Pie charts are good to use when you have few categories in your data set. 
They help in showing how one category is related to the other in proportion. I would say three to six categories would be appropriate. Pie charts can either show nominal or ordinal data. If you look at the anatomy of the pie chart, each category has a certain percentage that adds up to 100%. You can either call each portion or category of the pie as slices or wedges. If you're showing more than six categories, then the pie chart will become more crowded. It'll be harder to convey the message. So please keep the categories under six. We will be creating a pie chart of the profits from our Superstore dataset per region. This visualization is showing us sales data per category of the products within each state of USA on a map. You can try to create this visualization on your own and see if you get the desired results. Let's try to create a pie chart in Tableau. Let's connect to our Superstore dataset. Select orders data. Click on sheet one. Double click profit from measures and double click region from dimension. Go to show me and click on the pie chart. Let's try to fit this on the screen. Great, so now what we need to do is we need to label each portion or wedge. Bring the region and profit to the label marks pen. Great, we have our labeling done. Let's try to label the sheet as well. Let's increase the size of the font and make it bold. We'll do the same for the region and the profit. Format it and increase the font and bold it as well. Let's add it to the dashboard. Let's adjust the size. We will remove the total profit. Great, we have our pie chart visualization done. Have your dashboard with your selected histograms.